We're going to go to work, everybody. All power to the people. All power to the people. Right. Uh, this is not going to be, in, in, in Hollywood's language, your mama's average book party. What do I mean by that? Usually you come to a book party, you have a celebrity who's sitting down front and center, who usually says little or nothing but thank you very much and how should I sign it? And they sign a book and you get them some money and, and that's kind of it. That's not what this is today. The person who authored this book, or one of the authors, there's a co-author, uh, is not here and cannot be here for one ugly reason. He is a captive of the United States government and, and perhaps the best known political prisoner in the United States. That's Mumia Abu-Jamal, right? So this is going to be a very different kind of book party. This is not a, 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 a novel. This is not light, commercial, whodunit fiction. This is some real, pardon my French, some real shit, or some real history that is the history of these United States as an empire. This will spotlight the second of three volumes that he is co-authoring with a a, a filmmaker from Newark, New Jersey, Steve Vittoria, right? Y'all remember Long Distance Revolutionary and your neighborhood legend Sha Shaquille O'Neal uh, blocking it being shown here in Newark and how we had to rally right. and embarrass Mr. O'Neal and his, as his establishment over M Mumia, right? It was Steve Vittoria who made that film. Film went all over the world except Newark figure that out, right? Wow. So this enterprise, this exercise, this uh, this contribution, this weapon development, because this is indeed a weapon that Mumia is giving us, uh, is something that we can all use. Organizations looking for study tools, this is this is heavy, this is heavy armament, right? This is Shaka, you hear what I'm saying, right? I saw you nodding at Ed, right? You got you got some some new stuff for those young guns to read, all right? Maps of Freedom School, I'm glad you in the house. I know some of y'all been reading it, right? Right, so right on. So this is this is not your mama's book party, right? This is a heavy book party. I'm gonna begin with the libation, but before I do that, I wanna acknowledge some folks. Uh, I wanna acknowledge, she's, she's not up there, she likes to duck away when it comes to this stuff because mm -hmm. she's modest. And that is our sister, Masani Bar Barnwell, who was the co-owner of Source of Knowledge Bookstore, right? Uh, the one reason why this bookstore is still here is because unlike many uh, businesses in our community that are, all, that are our businesses in our community, we tend to go into these businesses as renters. And when our communities become targeted for that uh, 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 ethnic cleansing that they call gentrification, and this big money starts coming in and buying up all the property that knocks you out of your neighborhood, Right? If you don't own, you get your behind knocked out of your spot. And that includes what happens to black and brown businesses. Some years ago, they recognized the vulnerability of staying in that position and did what they had to do to own this building. Mm. So that's why, just across the street from City Hall, just five minutes from Penn Station, they are still here. Right? And it's the only black store this time in town. So I want to acknowledge them. And not just just for being here and surviving, but for what they are doing with the space, how they are opening it up for the community so that we can do exactly what we're doing. So I want to acknowledge them. Hold on, Todd, hold on. You go, you go get your say. I, I just want to add that they keep uh, turning down offers to buy this building. Too. That's right, how about that? that? That's right, because they, yeah, that's, that's what they, when they want it all, they want it all. Monopoly is not a euphemism either. <laughs> they really believe in that stuff, right? I want to uh, acknowledge Fred Wynn, right? A uh, great videographer, right? Fan Smiles, one of the baddest YouTube channels, the revolutionary action uh, off of, in YouTube land, right? And I see, and I see all you, you I, I see I got some, some 20th and 21st century folks up in here. You don't know how to handle your cell phones. I don't know how to handle mine either, but I hear them going off. Y'all need to figure that shit out, right? <laughs> In addition to Todd Burroughs, who already introduced himself indirectly, uh, who's got a book out on Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. Wells was born on July 16th. Mm -hmm. Who else was born on July 16th? Y'all saw that Asada, kick in the Asada. back? Asada. But, but I want to also acknowledge the New Jersey legend that, that is one of our unsung warriors in the Black Panther Party.
And he's the man that, that literally sent me into the new Black Panther Party. And that's Brother M.A. Smith, Brother Mark A. Smith, right? Mm -hmm. Smitty was quick to remind us mm -hmm. that, that, that his birthday ain't on Asada's birthday. Asada's birthday is on his birthday because Asada's the baby that's next right. to Smith, right. right? Yeah, Smitty. Y'all didn't know that brother. He was a great brother. Yes. Came out of the jungles of Korea and Vietnam on the heels of the North Rebellion, said, God damn it, I was in the wrong military. It's time for me to do something else. Mm -hmm. And went headlong into the world with the Black Panther Party. And has done some incredible work on that front, all up and down the highways and byways of this racist state for the Black Panther Party, an unsung hero that I love dearly. And those of us who knew him loved him dearly. And in the back is one of his comrades, Brother Otno Smith, right, who was also in the Newark chapter of the Black Panther Party. Right? And to his, to his right is his queen and when an old comrade, we go back to our, when we were once upon a time when we were young, right Gloria? <laughs> At Rutgers Dorp, but it was a very different place back then when we had our own buildings and we were bringing our community onto that campus even though they did not want our folks anywhere near that campus and we would show them what self-determination looks like and made them respect our community. So all this activity now that you see at Rutgers right. Newark is a right. consequence of that pressure that we put on their behinds back then, right? We need to be clear about that. Just behind Brother Otno is, is, is the great Bonnie Kness and Ojeri Lutulo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Bonnie Kness yeah. has been a lifeline yeah. to, to those of us who have been inside for, for decades, and her activism goes back to to, to Freedom Summer and then so we got to get you on tape, both of y'all, we got to get y'all on tape. We've been talking about that yeah. to the days of, the, of, of, the, of the height of the Civil Rights Movement under Martin Luther King. So she go from King to the Black Panther Party, that's the hell of a it's territory to cover, right? Mm -hmm. Ogiery, mm -hmm. there's a minor victory that we just won, and I'm not, I shouldn't say minor, it's, it's a victory. State of New Jersey just came out against solitary confinement the, right on the way it had been done for years by this 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 draconian state and brought it more in guidelines with uh, international human rights law but that was a fight but that man sitting next to her did over two decades in solitary confinement in solitary confinement Right? Mm -hmm. A warrior amongst us who we love theory. Brother Ogery, you just raise, I know you don't like to talk. You talk the way we used to talk without talking, right? Like that's talk. right. You like to bang. That's right. No, I that's, know him in prison. He likes right. to talk. <laughs> <laughs> he, used to, he used to curse me out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you probably needed that. Oh, yes, I did need it. Oh, God. <laughs> Brother Dasha, and uh, Annette Austin got a powerful book out on the great Harriet Tubman. No black woman greater amongst us ever than Harriet Tubman, I would dare say. She got one of the best books out on Harriet Tubman. So we got some bad, we got some heavy hitters in the house today that I really appreciate and that I'm glad you're here. Everybody all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, house business for those that just walked in. Uh, just behind the point of entrance, on the left is a restroom. Just beyond that table in the, in the yellow that has a sodas cake on it, right, uh, is a, a uh, cooler with some some water in it, so please keep yourself hydrated. 100 degrees ain't nothing to be, be uh, 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 pretentious about it. You'll get sick out here. I'm a heat stroke survivor. You need to be careful in this stuff, all right? So you gotta be careful in this stuff. So please hydrate yourself. And uh, with um, Brother Otno, with your permission as presiding elder, I want you to give me permission to proceed. Proceed. Okay. We have some shoulders to stand on and to acknowledge. And I'm not going to do a long libation because I really want us to get into what we need to get into. This is an action-oriented book party. We're going to be talking about what we need to be doing to help move this question and get some of our freedom fighters free. Y'all understand that? Okay, so I just want to say that first. But we can't talk about that without talking about those who we've lost a long way. And we've lost a lot, right? Can't we talk with Asada? Can't talk about Asada without talking about Sundiata. He's hiding back here, and we're going to fix that too. 82 years, young, 46 years in prison. It's time to bring him home. Yes, it is. Right? But who else is on the turnpike that got killed that night? Zaid Shakur, right? 
one of the best organizers the party had. So I will begin the libation this way, with the four directions, the north, the south, the east, the west, Ibaye, Ibaye, Jose Chakor, Ibaye, We, we've lost some folks along with Mumia. We, uh, Mumia lost his daughter a minute ago, oh, right? Gosh, Lydia, his wonderful sister. I missed the hell out of Lydia, loved the hell out of Lydia Wallace. Mumia's daughter and sister Lydia Wallace, we say Ibaye. Ibaye. Bruce Dixon, Chicago. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. I'm saving Bruce for the last. Brother Barrett Shango, Lydia's husband. That's right. That's right. Barrett Shango. It's Shaka Musa Barashanga, her, right. her husband and one of our great liberation theologists, Ibaye. 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 I'm having a senior moment. Bashir. Uh-huh. Who we'll said Bashir? Right? Yes. Yes. Bashir Hamid, once known as James York. Straight out of Jersey. I grew up with his family. Right? I guess it's real personal. Oh, you're messing my head up. Right? We lost Bashir in prison, mm. right? Just like we lost his co-defendant, Abdul Majid, in prison, mm. right? Uh, Majid lost his incredible wife and comrade trying to get him out of prison for Nandi Majid. So for Bashir Hamid, Abdul Majid, Nandi Majid, we say Ibaye. 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 Pardon my senior moment. Once they start, they don't stop, y'all. Young folks, get ready. Right, like Bruce it. Dixon. Yes. Right. Not only was he a, a, a central part of the searing analytical work of the Black Agenda Report, mm -hmm. he's a long veteran in our struggle for liberation uh, without, without compromise. Uh, we are approaching the uh, 50th anniversary of the haunting, horrific assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. It took place in December 4th, 69. But Bruce was a comrade of Fred and a part of that bold, growing, frightening, if you're on the other side of the issue, chapter that was the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Illinois chapter under Fred Hampton's leadership was one of the most feared by the enemies of our people. The most feared chapters of, our, in our, uh, of the party in the country. And so what happened on December 4th, 1969, be very clear, was no accident. For Bruce Dixon, for Fred, for Mark, we say Ibaye. Ibaye. We will end as we began with the four directions, the north, the south, the east, and the west. Ibaye. 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 Ashe. Oh, it is done. I'm going to bring my, my partner up here because he's a very modest man, but he's doing some incredible work that we're very uh, proud of. All the folks in the MAPSO Freedom School, how? Raise your hand. We're the MAPSO Freedom School folks, right? Okay, right on, right on. Now, I, I, he could give a better background on that, but I'm going to give him this background to bring him up. See, the contradiction is still capitalism, the state, and the pig. Be clear, right? Okay? Police brutality all over the place, right? Okay. You got to raise hell against that, right? That's right, okay. of course. They made a mistake of beating up one of his one of his children, one of his students, mm -hmm. on videotape. And this is, you know, prominent stuff. You know, chief directing, you know, the whole thing, you know, above the law, the way they carry themselves. You know how they carry themselves. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're, they have to assert their authority and let you know that they are the law, right? <laughs> Well, as this happened, you know, not only did they beat up this 17-year-old young man because he was a big young man and he wasn't moving quick enough for him, but they were taking and then dig this, y'all. Fourth of July. What is the Fourth of July? Ah, oh. Independence, Independence Day for white supremacy in the United States. I'm qualifying that because four million of our folks had nothing to do with that, right? Not a damn thing to do with that. Ironically celebrating Independence Day. I don't know why they were celebrating it. They didn't get the memo that we're trying to give them yet, right? Being what they thought what was an American thing to do, Pam. Mm -hmm. Celebrating Independence Day because this police chief said all these young Negroes must not be in Maplewood. We're going to get them all out of here. 
and pushed them all with a, a military escort. That's when the police is pushing you. That's the military action. Be mm -hmm. clear about that. So uh, over the course of doing that to them, they beat this brothers. They beat this little brothers behind badly, but forgot that they had all this videotape footage. Mm. Because as soon as we call it out, or they call it out, they said, well, "Where's the videos?" Ah, uh, 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 and they tried to sweep this stuff up under the rug. But then them videos got all got turned loose, and they and, and the pressure continued to mount in the community because that young man in the leadership of the Mapso Freedom School continued to mount that pressure in the streets, shutting down City Hall, packing City Hall meetings, and got rid of that police chief. Got rid of that police chief, right? So I want to introduce this young man. He's not your mama's regular school teacher. He's a <laughs> radical black educator. He's a radical black educator, right? And I couldn't do this without him. Y'all give T.J. Whitaker some <laughs> Family? Peace. Um, I will be brief, uh, but I want to couch my terms um, in the context of, of our freedom fighters. So um, over the last couple of weeks, um, I've had the opportunity, along with um, my comrade Rodney Jackson in the back, who we've been um, doing ah, this political prisoner work um, for almost, what, maybe three decades now? Yeah. Um, yeah. But last week we had a chance to go and see Brother Jalil Muntaki. Oh, pal, um, to the people. Yes, right. yes. Right. Uh, we Free all know Jaleel. that uh, our brother is going to be going before the parole board yet again uh, in September. Um, while this looks like it might be the most promising uh, opportunity or chance for him to get out, um, given some of the changes that have taken place in the parole board, um, you know, he's not counting on the enemy to just, you know, let him go. Um, so what he has and what we've been asking for folks to do is to call uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, office on Mondays. Um, if you are interested in doing that in support of the brother and following his or his, his request, um, you know, you can go to freejalil.com or you can get the information through uh, Zaid. Um, but one of the things we wanted, I wanted to talk about, um, last week, uh, Jalil talked about some of the anxiety um, that he's currently going through. Um, he's been, he's experienced the anxiety as you might expect his entire time in prison. Um, but with this impending uh, parole hearing, um, his sleep has, is lacking even more. Um, and, and he's just, he's concerned, right, in that way. Inability to sleep up all night, uh, trying to deal with some of those things. And so um, he's just asking for the people, for us to do our part uh, if we can. Uh, and to again make those call to Governor Cuomo so that he can again be released in September. Um, Brother Robert Seth Hayes, uh, a year ago on Thursday, was paroled from the New York State Department of Corrections. Oh, um, uh, he drove up on Thursday, um, not even knowing that it was the anniversary of his release. Um, and we hooked up with uh, Brother Seth Hayes, uh, took him out for lunch, uh, commemorated that year of his, his quote unquote freedom. Um, and Seth grew up in Buffalo, he's from Buffalo, but had never been to Niagara Falls. Um, and so we took him to Niagara Falls and had a couple of hours of, you know, just kind of camaraderie there, uh, spent some time with him. But please know um, that he is living in um, VA housing. And before he was released from prison, we, we, we know that uh, Brother Seth suffers from diabetes. Um, and he's had, he had a number of life-threatening situations in prison before he was released. That's right. But everybody should know that since he's been out, the last year he's been out, um, he's had three more incidents. Um, three times he's passed out in public, mm -hmm. and it was only due to the grace of good brothers and sisters who happened to be around, who picked him up and took him to a house, or who picked him up and got him some water or some food. Um, but he is not in a good situation. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, honoring the troops and standing for the pledge and the oh, flag yeah, and all that yeah. bullshit, right. all right, we need to know, right, we know that the largest, you know, uh, homeless population is veterans. We know that the largest suicide population is veterans. And so that's what our brother is living in. Um, he is fighting. He is struggling. He is in good spirits. Um, but for someone who, you know, gave his life. That's right. For our freedom, that's right, right? That's not good enough, that's right? right? And that's we right. can we can do better, that's right? right? Um, and then lastly, um, I think it's important um, when we talk about fighting fascism, right? And this united front to, to fight fascism. 
um, David Gilbert is a political prisoner. David Gilbert was one of the founders of SDS, right, and the Weather Underground organization. Um, he's serving a 75 year to life sentence um, for the failed Brinks expropriation back in 1981. White dude, right? Assisting Sekou Dinga, Kwesi Balagoon, right, in the mm -hmm. Brinks expropriation mm -hmm. to support the movement. Not your mama's white liberal. Exactly, not your mama's yeah. white liberal, right? right. Um, and so when we talk about building this united front against fascism, right on. Those right. are the kind of, of allies <laughs> right. we need. And right when we talk right. about not even allies right. at this point, we want co conspirators. That's right. That's right. All right. Yeah. Because just being an ally at this point is not good enough. You need to be down with us, right, in terms of turning this thing over. Um, I'm going to like just come to a close here. But one of the things that has just come down in the last week for us teachers um, in terms of this fight, um, Steve Sweeney, I, I believe, uh, uh, state senator, come on. Come um, on. proposed a bill to outlaw the teaching of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. right, um, in public schools and higher education. And so we know what that means, right? And so anytime you say something against the state of Israel, right, they're coming after you. So they're trying to codify that in law. Um, we're trying to build a coalition of educators and students and anti-war activists. But in terms of this united front against fashion, that's going to be our contribution to it, or one of our contributions right. to it, right? Yeah. right? Bringing our freedom fighters home is going to be another contribution right. to it, but we have work to do. Um, I look forward to hearing Sister Pam uh, and Brother Glenn Ford. All power to the people. Thanks All to everybody for coming out. Y'all heard what he said, right? Yeah. Nelson Mandela's birthday was also this week too, right? And, and I made a mistake. That's the name I forgot in the libation. And I apologize to, to your ancestor, my ancestor. But um, Nelson Mandela was an enormous inspiration to our political prisoners, right? Nelson Mandela did 27 years of captivity. But we talk about Robert Seth Hayes, who was a combat veteran, right? before he joined the Black Panther Party, and before he went into the Black Liberation Army, right? He was in a combat scenario, saving one of his comrades life when he was captured and taken into custody in 1973 and, and convicted. He did 45 years in prison, right? And he's got to come out, you know, without the love and support that he certainly needs. So I just wanted to echo that. We talk about Jaleel. Jaleel has been inside for 48 years, right? I have elders, and some of some of us are, are, are you know, are older than that. But most of y'all in this room ain't nowhere even near 40. But imagine being locked up for over 40 years. Imagine that for standing up for what's right. Certainly, they deserve a whole lot more love and respect and support from our community that we get, than, they, than they're getting. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But I want to add to what TJ said also about all of you who belong to organizations, you need to be sending letters to from your organizations to, to demand Jaleel's release. And there are formats that we have, if, you want to, if you're concerned about form and language, that you, that you need to do because there is a framework that we're trying to deal with, even though we don't like it, straight up, right? But so you need to, we need to be talking about your organizations being a part of that. I want you also to know that the People's Organization for Progress, Ingrid Hill, the Vice Chair of the People's Organization for Progress is in the house. <laughs> On this question of that new bill that TJ's talking about, see, see they study you, you don't study yourself. That's why these books that we do in the day are important, right? Y'all don't study no more. Y'all just Google and be bullshitting, right? We, you young heads, we need y'all to study this. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, can't don't do show, you can't shortcut this. One thing about the comrades in your organization, mm -hmm. they study, right? I was, I was checking that young daughter out that's out there in Ferguson. We just ain't, and ain't, ain't been out in this a long time, but the, the study that she has done that reflects her maturation, even just being young in the movement, is, is clear. Mm -hmm. That's clear. So this question of study is important. They studied the anti-apartheid movement. 
They studied the hell we raised that made Nelson Mandela homemade name inter, uh, internationally. They studied how we shut down these college campuses and these banks over their investment in apartheid. And, and this bill coming to you from the Zionist lobby, the, uh, 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 the Zionist state that gets $3 billion a year without a, the battening of an eye. Three million, three billion dollars a year, right? What the whole continent of Africa gets doesn't come anywhere close to that. But they get that without any kind of questioning or critical analysis, and this is to make sure that they don't get that. Why? Because they have taken the genocide of Palestinian people to a such a vile and explosive place. They know that in, in, in real terms, for all their pretentiousness of being righteous and, and, and religious and, and super proper and all that, they know they're in bad shape. They know that what they're doing is wrong. You take people off there laying and shooting down their women and children uh, in the street and they ain't got nothing but rocks and prayers, you know that's wrong. You're starving them. You're not allowing them even free to, to have water and some of the basic necessities of life. You stop. That's genocide. That's right. Huh? Genocide was wrong then. Genocide is wrong now. And it's the height of hypocrisy that a state that was built in response to them surviving genocide would now come out as a part of the agents of empire in what is northern Africa. That's all Israel is. It is the, the, the beachhead for the northern empire on northern Africa. That's what it is. Be clear about that. So, the, so how dare they think that they are above criticism and accountability? That's bullshit. I ain't got much money, and this cracker takes every tax dollar he can out of my behind every year. And, I'm, I, and I know I'm not as polite as many, but all you polite taxpayers, you should have something to say about $3 billion going into your hand that's sponsoring and hoodwinking and okay and slaughter that's happening on a daily basis. Huh? On our watch. No, there is a real uh, emerge, uh, emerging movement against the uh, Israeli apartheid that is beginning to develop some momentum nationally, intergenerationally and, nas and internationally, right? And they see that coming, so they head off the, 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 the youth segment from which it springs, they coming up with this fascistic law. Right. See, we ain't talking, we, we're talking about what the Black Panther Party called for in 1969, but in the age of Trump, you better understand that fascism has some real practical, right now in our goddamn faces, dimensions that we need to deal with. Y'all understand that, right? So give TJ another round of applause. Your organizations, your organizations should be coming out with letters going to everybody that's in the, the state assembly, that's in the state senate, saying under no circumstance can we support a law like this. That's right? right. That's if right. Y'all can talk all that stuff about Israel being an ally of the United States, but you cannot talk about them being above criticism by the people of the United States. And if the people got a serious problem with that, then y'all need to straighten that out or we need to get rid of some of y'all so we can straighten it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's right. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Dare to see yourselves as being the change you what you're looking for. Dare to see yourselves like that. Because that's the only way it's going to get done. That's right. Right? All right. So over the course of the day, Brother, Brother Glenn Ford is going to have his own remarks on the matter of fascism in this day and time. Brother Deruba bin Wahabi will Skype him in in a little while. Deruba was a part of that whole motion and was there in 69 when that legendary call was made to, to, to call for a national united front against fascism. When you had another fascist, racist, sexist, criminal in the White House so by the of name of Richard Nixon, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Some of us some of us are old enough to remember that bastard, ain't we? Ain't we? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> he was an original no good bastard, that's right. Oh, yes. And I'm not saying that jokingly, because he was, That's see, right. fascists are dangerous people. They use the, 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 the armaments of the state to, to deliberately hurt as many people as they can or are comfortable with hurting. And they were principally responsible for ultimately destroying our movement, destroying the Black Panther Party, and for our political prisoners still being inside. 
That's what fascism does, right? So we, this is not no romantic stuff, and I ain't just shooting wolf tickets. We want some real change, and we need to do some real organizing to be the change that we need to see. Y'all understand that? Yeah. Right. Um, to my students and my popcorn kids family, I know y'all not used to hearing me talk like this. This ain't popcorn, kids, <laughs> right? This is the real deal, all right. right? To my popcorn kids, get them some love. Right? <laughs> All right, and we're going to have some remarks now, some, some observations of the book. All right, we'll have Lisa Davis and Todd uh, Burroughs uh, give us a few minutes of our observations of the book. Uh, we're going to figure, we're going to dribble it that blend, come up after that, and we'll see if we can stipe the Ruba in. Then you, you close it out, and we're going to sell some books. Are we all right with that? All right, now, if anybody needs to, like, oh, I'm sorry, right? It's like, I got to go pick up. My wife for like 20 minutes. Like, could I buy the book before you know? I know Pam may start yet. Yes, you, we could. We could take care. <laughs> we could definitely do that. All right, Lisa, come give you a mark. Lisa Davis from Black is Back Coalition and one of the most militant Black women of my generation, also in the People's Organization for Progress. Give us some love. For that last comment in terms of my militancy, I blame people like Pam Africa. Right on, right on. I blame right. women like Amina Barak. In fact, yes. um, I was told that um, I was not the first <laughs> choice for this selection to read anything about this, but um, that a brother Zaid tried to get our wonderful warrior and example in the struggle, Sister Amina Baraka. Yes. And I said to myself, to be considered a second. I might not have even been a second. May she I? Was, you were second. Okay, I was a second. <laughs> you were Mina Baraka. What an honor. That's all. I was so humbled by it. I mean, I was like, wow. He thought of me after he thought of her first. So um, definitely in whatever we do, and especially when we are gathered in the city of Newark, um, we always have to remember the Barakas and certainly Sister Mina Baraka because um, she helped to raise me even when we didn't know each other. And her seed, hopefully, got planted in me somewhat. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of examples from this uh, book, part two, that really stuck out at me. But before doing so, um, I saw a post uh, today on Facebook. And um, there are just so many, many outrageous Example. I'm not going to even call it an example because it is a way of life. It is what this country is. And to be patriotic is the acceptance of absolute madness. To be patriotic means that you close your eyes to the horrors that's committed by this country and that you accept this absolute madness. Um, but still, when you continue to see examples of it, it can still... Uh, shock you and all these other kind of things and somebody had printed something on Facebook talking about ice had a picture saying that there were ice representatives Ferry Street in Newark hide your kids and this is in Newark New Jersey right around the corner from us um, this stuff is so real and it is so horrible and when I was thinking about that I couldn't help but to think about oh gee whiz every black person in this country especially who um, ancestors came through the transatlantic slave trade, that should bring back horrible memories to us when um, our parents had to hide, our us and hide their children. And um, I know, I know I, my mother used to always say, make sure the shades are closed. Don't ever let your shades up. Close them when the lights are on. Close them. It's like if those shades are up, she would just pass out. And I used to think that that was just something everybody did. But mm -hmm. I noticed as I got older that I didn't see white people up north with their shades closed when the lights were on. And I just couldn't help but to think what some of that had to do with all that trauma because maybe up north, because they had the uh, Fugitive Slave app and they would just catch people. And maybe that was, um, you know, some reverberation from when you didn't feel comfortable to be in your own home. So you had to make sure everything was hidden and all of that. And that just sort of reminds me with what's currently going on today with the ice raids and everything. They got to hide their kids. Okay, and on that note, um, some of the passages that stuck out at me, like I said, I'm just going to read a couple. This is going to be a power pack day, but um, it's just uh, so strong. And this is on page 
25, um, in which uh, Mumia is writing about Fortress America. And um, he writes, we continuously use a word that isn't really used in daily conversation, imperialism. But by doing so, we only reveal what is happening around the world, despite the lack of conversation either among ourselves or in the corporate media, because if something isn't normally discussed openly, it surely is not a reason to reject it. But we believe that U.S. imperialism is central and predominant to international relations as well as to domestic relations, as it dramatically impacts both economically, psychologically, and historically. Let's never lose sight of the bottom line. The wealth of the, of the U.S. nation is used to create Fortress America instead of addressing the needs of its citizenry and, of course, the poor and dispossessed. To illustrate how imperialism works in the real world, we quote a conversation between a former U.S. president and his foreign underlings, for it illustrates what we are preparing with unusual clarity. We turn to Mark Zepozoire, who quotes the 36th president of the United States, formerly known at Southwest Texas State Teachers College as Bullshit Johnson, as he launches into a tirade against Greek nationalists who dared to protest U.S. actions. When the Greek ambassador objected to Johnson's plan for settling a dispute concerning Cyprus, LBJ said, fuck your parliament and your constitution. America is an elephant. Cyprus is a flea. Greece is a flea. If those two fleas continue itching the elephant, they may just get whacked by the elephant's trunk, whacked good. If your prime minister gives me talk about democracy, parliament, and constitutions, he, his parliament, and his constitution may not last very long. And that, of course, is from Johnson, who's considered to be a good president, yeah. exactly, yeah. Democrat, yeah. who did yeah. things for black people. And whoa, does that, does that sound like an American president or a mafia don? Answer both until the ignorant atrocity elected as Murder Incorporated's 45th CEO. This truthful utterance, this political trash talk, would not see the light of public day. It would be in the shadows behind closed doors. In public, the dialogue would be usual spit shined American bullshit, somehow hollow banality about liberty, freedom, and God's hand moving in exceptional ways. But what we're actually witnessing in bullshit Johnson's diatribe is imperialism in action. Ground floor, right off the assembly line, imperialism. Do what we want or else. If you're a teenager in high school, this book will bear no similarity to the children's books provided you by a deferential, cringing history teacher right. whose job it is to drug you with false patriotism uh, and yes. subservience to political leaders. But here you will find no peons to the once living gods of American myth like Washington and cherry trees, Johnson on liberty, or Adams and the rights of women. We present no myths, fables, or fabled glories of empire. Our work throughout this enterprise, enterprise is raw, hard, real. Mm. The truth like we never get it. <laughs> and now, um, and I thought it was really important again to read that one because um, was about Johnson, the one that was good to us, supposedly. One of the better ones. One of the more liberal ones. Yeah. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in right now. Um, this next uh, chapter, I mean, this next part that jumped out at me um, is about the Robert League of Nations. On the surface, the creation of the League of Nations, the forerunner of the UN, you know, that wonderful, 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 wonderful mediator of uh, all good things, you know, to the press people of the world. But anyway, appears to be a selfless and humane move toward what Woodrow Wilson deemed a just peace. Wilson's 14 points, which outlined his godlike calling to end war and create a safer world, fit perfectly into his divinely ordained mission of manifest destiny, forcing the world, for its own good, of course, to turn to America for these moral aspirations, which lie at the basis of all freedom. That's the only reason America ever does anything, right? 
Established in 1919 after the end of World War I, the League was assembled by the victorious Allied nations to enforce the terms of the Castigatory Cast Cast Twenty of Versailles. With all of Europe still smoldering and the stench of death still rank in the air, Russian leader and recent revolutionary Vladimir Lenin called this new diplomatic body the Robber League of Nations. Brown University professor Bill Keach Wright Lenin argued that Woodrow Wilson's great plan for international peace and cooperation was really an extension of the very imperialist forces that had created the war in the first place. Obviously, Lenin clearly understood the direct connection between the ravenous desire of predatory capitalism and its insatiable need to wage wars of plunder and control. Lenin argued that socialists have always condemned wars between nations as barbarous and brutal. We understand the inevitable connection between wars and the class struggle within a country. We understand that wars cannot be abolished unless classes are abolished and socialism is created. The Russian leader was acutely aware that socialism had not yet been fully created after the First World War, either in Russia or internationally, writes Keach. Because of this, he understood that the League of Nations and the entire post-war post war policy coming out of the Treaty of Versailles were in fact agreements among the winners of the Great War about how to assure their continued domination. Impressive can only describe the revolutionaries of the time as their critical analysis of capitalism's kinship with war was nothing short of prescient, prophetic, and damn near clairvoyant when looking at the current intrigues of the American empire. Called by some the best brain of after Marx, fiercely independent Rosa Luxemburg was no shill for dogma of any kind and spent a lifetime defining the natural connection between um, capitalism and war. Standing on the eve of World War I, she clearly understood that militarism in both its forms as war and as armed peace is a legitimate child, a logical result of capitalism. Her deeper analysis reads like a spot-on contemporary critique of Western hegemony, and I'll just read this one brief paragraph. For social democrats to endeavor to make it clear to people that militarism is closely linked up with colonial policies, with tariff politics, and with international politics, and that therefore the present nations, if they really seriously and honestly wish to call a halt on competitive armaments, would have to begin by disarming in the commercial political field, giving up colonial predatory campaigns and the international politics of spheres of influence in all parts of the world. In a word, their, in their foreign as well as in their domestic policies, they would have to do the exact contrary of everything which the nature of the present politics of a capitalist class state demands. Okay, so. Shout to the people! Shout to the people! Well, that's right. That's right. Goodness knows if I would accidentally walk out with it. This child is coming up. Where's the sign-in sheet, y'all? Right, make sure that goes around because we got a lot of new faces in the house. I want y'all to know what we're doing. Right. Uh, the last thing we did for those of y'all new to us that we did was pay uh, Senator Robert Menendez's office a yes. visit when he uh, had the gall to come out. Uh, and, and demand Asada's extradition uh, back to the United States, to demand Guillermo Morales' extradition back to the United States after it was folks who, just like you in this room, right, who voted for his behind. And he, he had one, he was one foot away from his behind going to jail, not just leaving the Senate. His behind was getting ready to go to jail. But, but you saved him. Uh, I know we're trying to figure out why. But you saved this behind her, and so what did he do? Come right and spit in your face, right? Over some of our freedom fighters. Like, he spit in your That's face. Mm -hmm. See? So we paid him a visit, right? And uh, and, and we, were, we were welcomed 
by a, a, a sea of, of black, young black people, new police officers who really didn't know what to expect from, I don't good baby, thank you, from this, this sea of outrage that's willing to come right to the Gateway Center and rush out and make all this goddamn noise about this Democrat who y'all thought was y'all friend. You're out of your damn mind. You're out of your damn mind. For those of you who are Democrats, you should have a mission, right? Those of your elders who are like in the way of change, you need to see yourselves as insurgents within those ranks to remove them, right? Sister, uh, uh, Alex, oh, Sister AOC ain't come out the sky. She came off the streets. She saw that there was, you know, that these old Democrats were bullshit, and she replaced one, right? Ayanna Presley, up in Boston. She didn't come out the sky. She came out on Mama's womb and was trying to do the right thing, and she saw some old Democrats with bullshit, and she replaced one, right? Mm -hmm. Ilhan Omar, right? Who Trump is threatening. Right? They are threatening to do something to this little to this daughter. Right? So we need to be talking about not just supporting her morally with solidarity. We need to be talking about some real protection mm -hmm. and support around those of us who come under fire from these fascists, right? She didn't come out the sky. She was in the time and the place where they need to get a get rid of some old dog dead with dead weight. Democrat and she be, and then took that mess over and they're shaking things up even though they're within that paradigm and framework for all of its limitations, right? But they're still inside agitating, shaking stuff up. See, once upon a time we had a thing called inside-outside strategy, right? Old heads, y'all know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? Right? So well, it's good because we ain't had nobody inside like that in a long time. So we appreciate that, there's a, that, that there are some folks inside like that. So if you must be Democrats, if you must be Democrats, <laughs> please don't be a Lyndon. <laughs> please don't be a Clinton. Right? An Obama. Right? Don't be an Obama. Please don't be an Obama. Right? At least be an, an AOC and then whatnot. And then push it further to the left. Kenny. Todd Burroughs, go ahead, raise hell, beloved. I'm sorry. I go off like that. I, I don't have any sense. It's so okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks to my uh, friend, Dr. Jared Ball of uh, Morgan State University, who you should all be on his website, I mix what I like mm -hmm. yeah. I know you're all here. What I, like. I mix what I like .org. I know you've all been to the site. If not, you need to go. Thanks to Dr. Ball, I've had the honor of uh, knowing Glenn Ford and had the honor of knowing mm -hmm. the Ruben Mahad. So I know what awaits you. So I'm going to be as brief as possible. So let me take my opening comments and take a half hour and turn it into one minute and then I'm going to do some reading. I've been researching Ramil Gujmal's life for 20 years. I'm writing a biography on him. Wow. The biography started as a journalistic biography in which I was going to view Mumia from the point of view of the history and development of black journalism in the 20th and 21st century. However, I took too long because Mumia has now evolved into something else. Mumia now is no longer satisfied with just the op-ed format. He is no longer just satisfied with the kind of more uh, popular presentation of a George Jackson analysis. Mumia has decided to go to the next level and replace Howard Zinn. That's right. And mm. replace Jerome right. Bennett. That's right. Mm. That is what this trilogy of books is about. All right? So if you have not read these books, uh, you can hear from our sister. Thank you for that excellent um, yes. summary right. yeah, of, right of what right on, right he was been talking about. And Stephen Victoria. And Stephen right. Victoria. He's a business. He business is, he, they are both presenting <laughs> what is, well, until the squad, right, what, has what used to be unpopular, and I guess when a Democrat comes in office, it'll be unpopular again, which is a decolonized perspective. Right. These books, right. by the way, published by Noelle Hanrahan, the woman who was responsible right. for ha putting Mumia on the air in the first place, uh, she's the publisher of, this book, of these books. Okay. So we're talking about a, a history of decolonization done from the perspective of decolonization. Uh, so I just wanted to, to say that as someone who's studied Mumia's writings going all the way back to when he was 15 years old writing for the Black Panther newspaper, 
from those essays to today, at 65, we are getting the same analysis of capitalism, of imperialism. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that. There's a lot more I can say about that, but I'm not going to do that because I want to read uh, part of the book. Now, one of the things that Stephen Victoria and Mumia have done in this book series, again, this is the second of three, and Pam, is, is the next one coming out next year? Because I, I feel like they've been coming out once a year. It's, it might be coming out in December. The third one's going to come out in December? December. <laughs> wow. Here they are. And I want you to understand, these are, these are 300 plus page books exactly. with footnotes and endnotes that go on for 30, 40 pages. This is, this is not a collection of essays. These are actual historical books that are decolonized. Mm -hmm. And these two have produced three, they're gonna produce three in as many years, right? So one of the things that they decided to do in these books is, is that after giving an analysis of white supremacy, capitalism, in this particular book, militarism, they then decided that each book would end with people who were standing for a humane society. And this section of, of both books are called No. Right? They have a whole back section called No. And so each of the authors choose a person that they profile that is a profile in radical courage, so to speak. Right on. All right? Right on. So right on, I'm assuming yeah. that Mumia chose the person I'm about to read. Um, I wish I could read the whole thing. I cannot, because again, I know how brilliant Glenn Ford is, and you need to hear him. That's yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to read a small part of the person I think Mumia chose for his person, and, and then we'll, we'll move on to more substantive speakers. Many years ago, decades in fact, a young woman wanted to become a lawyer. She was a good student, very smart, and with the loving support of her mother and family, all of her dreams seemed within reach. Her mother was a hairdresser, and as such, in the black community of West Philadelphia, this meant a good living. For black women, then and as now, spent a good sum to tame their lots, to relax those rebellious, temptuous kinks and curls. The young woman was in pre-law classes at Temple University's North Philadelphia campus, where perhaps the majority of the city's lawyers made their foundation to a life lived in the law. Perhaps the private school, University of Pennsylvania poured some challenge, but as Temple was a state-supported college, it lured more of the city's up-and-coming working-class kids. Her road was set, and before her seemed few obstacles, except for the usual presented for black women in a society marked by racial and sexual animus. She studied the U.S. Constitution and read treatises by law professors, waxing wise and eloquent on the rights and privileges of American citizenship. Perhaps she dreamed of representing the poor and underprivileged in the courts of the land with a bold white lettered nameplate on her desk, Ramona Johnson, Esquire. Her office would be a Tony downtown address where she would mingle with the wealthy and the famous. Or perhaps she dreamed of representing corporations, for that is where the money is, in a high-rise office in Center City, maybe part of a small but lucrative law firm where she was both partner and a rainmaker. Wilson and Johnson Law Offices, PC. But dreams are, after all, dreams. They are bridges that get us through the night. They live in a dominion all their own, on the twinkling twilight of consciousness. Yet although such dreams were possible for her, as they were for tens of thousands of young women in the 1970s, for Ramona, they were not to be. Her path changed forever when she discovered MOVE, a small but spirited commune in West Philadelphia, comprised of black, Latino, Asian, and white young rebels committed to the radical change of the American system and immediate move back to nature. But MOVE didn't extinguish her dreams. The city of Philadelphia did. That's right, that's right. They did it by trying nine MOVE members in a 1978 courtroom where all those precious rules that Ramona studied were turned into little more than dust. Mm -hmm. They took her from the soft and comfortable schoolroom of theory and hurled her into a courtroom charade in Philadelphia City Hall where she witnessed things that took her breath away. She learned by the very living of it what real law was and was not. It transferred her from a bookish, somewhat naive young college student into a revolutionary. And it sent her and the city into a spiral that would transform both forever. MOVE was a small but loud group of naturalists, famous 
or infamous, depending on your point of view. Right. For above all else, resisting. It seemed like they resisted everything. <laughs> Industry. <laughs> the Philadelphia Zoo. Right celebrities. The cops. The courts. The media. Everything. Now, it unfortunately, again, I wish I had time, but it goes on and it talks about the 1978 confrontation that MOVE had with the police in which James Ramp, a white police officer, gets killed and By that's so-called friendly fire. And the, that's the famous incident of Delbert, Africa, being beaten by the that's police right. on, on right. video. That's right. Uh, which has been shown around the world. Um, and then, you know, it, it goes on about MOVE and about how Ramona Africa was the only adult survivor of a decision in which the United States, a city in the United a city in the United States, decided to bomb its own people. Mm -hmm. um, and she was the only adult survivor to that. In the city of brotherly love they did that? With a black mayor. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. What are we just gonna do? Now I just want to say what I what I started with is that you know, now, now radicalism has become in vogue, right? Every time we get a Republican president, radicalism becomes in vogue, right? And then every time we get a Democratic president, we're talked we were talked to about how we're supposed to negotiate and to be part of the system and get something from the system, etc. So, I, I don't know exactly what the state of decolonization is, right? It's kind of hazy at the point because we have a lot of people who are acting very decolonized. Um, I do understand that Mumia Abu Jamal, and I say this as his biographer, he has been saying the same thing since he was 15 years old. And the same people that tried to follow him to Goddard College when he left the Black Panther Party and, and wanted to go to Goddard College, and Goddard College would not let the FBI spy on him, are the same people who to this day fight every single advance that he has done. As a result of that struggle, he has produced, I think this is book number 12, 12 books of radical, decolonized nonfiction, including, by the way, this I think is one of his most underrated books. That's right. That's An right. Examination of Jailhouse Lawyers. That's right. How activists in prison become like their own inside. lawyers. Mm -hmm. He right. was in jail interviewing people across the country for this book. This book is well better researched than some books I've seen on the outside. Right. All right, which is a hallmark, by the way, of his writing, by the way. Um, what he doesn't say is that he became one himself. Right. You have to. What he doesn't <laughs> say is about the people he tried to help in prison as a jailhouse lawyer. So we're talking about somebody who is completely committed and who's always been completely committed to decolonizing thought and to disrupting the powers that be. Not asking for a concession when they're in power, not being a radical because it's in vogue when your friends are out of power, but actually asking for the change of the society radically, meaning structurally. And I think that we're becoming quite confused with exactly what decolonizing means and what it is to be decolonized. And I think that these books, um, as blatant as they are, I think kind of assist in that dialogue. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you. Now, now we got to get some deep people here to talk. Go ahead. All right. Did y'all did y'all know that background about Mona? No. Huh? I did not know that. And what do you call that in revolutionary terms? Mona could have been a bougie ass, comfortable Negro lawyer. Yes, she could have been. Oh, right? um, Class Come on, baby. Well, say it again so they can hear you. That's who Mona Africa is. And, and I can like just say one thing. That story parallels directly the story of Asada Shakur. When you go on YouTube right. and you watch Gil Noble's interview with Asada Shakur, I'm assuming it's still up there. Yeah. Asada talks about the same thing. She was going to go and become part of the system, but she said being radical was normal. And once she discovered radicalism, she never stuck back. So, back. So, so we see the parallel between Ramona Africa and the Nasada Shakur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She studied nursing, I think, right? She studied a little, she studied a little bit of little this and a little bit of that. Y'all see this picture? Uh -huh. Who is this? This is one of New Jersey's 
first great anti-fascist, Paul Robeson. Okay. Right? Paul Robeson. You can't talk about history and talk about fighting fascism sitting here in Newark, New Jersey, and not talk about Paul Robeson. And who else we got to talk about on that front? Who, who taught, who, who, those of us of my generation, who taught us not my generation in this town? I'm who taught us? That's right. That's right. Right? So, so, so this, this fight, this stance, this identification, this analysis, this resistance to this thing called fascism ain't no goddamn abstraction. It is real. Right? And, and, and the tasks before us are real. So and these are the shoulders that we're standing on. And I think we would all agree that these shoulders are, 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 have, have more than your ordinary strength, don't they? So we shouldn't have to be standing wobbly exactly. on these shoulders. We need to be standing firmly on these shoulders exactly. to figure out what the hell we need to do to decolonize this whole arrangement. Right on, Todd Burroughs. Wonderful presentation, brother. Yes, Appreciate yes. that. Dead on point. Dead on point. Give him a round of applause. Now, uh, we're going to have the great Glenn Ford come up in the Black Agenda Report. And, and the, we'll talk about it. I've been hitting. I've been hitting, you know, from different angles. You know, boxes, we work angles. You understand? Mm -hmm. Right? It's a great fight on today, right? So That's all right. this stuff That's is in my right. head. So I'm just hitting angles, but I'm going to let you take it right up the middle. The Glenn Ford, y'all give us some love. <laughs> Power to the people. All power, power to, the people. to the people. You know, I, I have to apologize. I didn't realize, and it is totally my fault, that I was supposed to talk about uh, fascism uh, in today's time. But you know, it's it's very difficult not to talk about fascism when that's what you got, and that is what we have had for a very long time. Uh, so so I, I just want to mention uh, that the United States was the original fascist state. It's the OG fascist uh, state. Uh, and, and yet it's uh, never acknowledged uh, by the powers that ahead, be. Man. Jim Crow was the model for fascism. Right. Uh, Hitler says so, and fascists all over the world said so. That's right. It was the first racially, totally racially regimented, regimented society in the world and the rest of the white settler states and uh, incipient fascist states copied from that model. Uh, the Jim Crow South was a very big place, is a very big place. It's bigger than most European countries in population and in area. It was a big uh, model and it was located in the most prosperous and therefore thought of as most successful of the capitalist countries. Uh, so, yes, it was a shining light uh, for fascism, uh, but uh, even going by uh, the descriptions that most scholars uh, agree upon uh, are relevant to European fascism, uh, we see that U.S. Jim Crow fascism, and as it <coughs> leaks out over the rest of the country, uh, actually uh, was more uh, consistent with the description of fascism than most of the fascisms of Europe. Uh, here's what they say constitutes a fascist state. Hatred of the other as an organizing principle. Of course, the other uh, in our fascism was us. Right. Uh, and the whole society of Jim Crow was organized around hatred and suppression of black people. Uh, a one-party state, absolutely. Uh, the Jim Crow South was a Democratic Party, one-party right. state. The Republican Party was the Black Party, and when That's Black right. people couldn't vote no more, there was no Republican Party. So it was a one-party state. Uh, a tendency to resort to mob rule. That's what lynching uh, is about, whether big, big lynchings or small lynchings. The tendency to unleash the mob. Uh, supports a state that supports the interests of the worst elements of the bourgeoisie. Well, we saw that institutionalized, of course, uh, under Jim Crow with convict leasing, uh, in which their version of mass black incarceration uh, was quite capitalist. Uh, uh, they locked folk up and rented them out to the worst elements of the bourgeoisie. And, th and finally, a, a militaristic regime, a one in which the regime is militaristic but encourages uh, all the most militaristic elements of society. And so here, we need to point out that the South has always been the most 
militaristic society. I'm talking about the white South uh, in the whole country. It had to be uh, because every uh, adult uh, white male was obligated uh, to be at least nominally part of the local militia uh, whose job it was to guard against slave rebellions. Uh, so we had a thoroughly militarized white South over generations of slavery, which is why the South did so well in the Civil War, even with far less resources and a far smaller uh, population, uh, because they were already militarized. This was not uh, new to them. They were ready uh, to go to war. So we have the perfect example of fascism coming uh, in the post-Reconstruction uh, South. When they talk, now we're all talking about fascism. Fascism, nobody's talked, they, we didn't talk as much uh, in, 19, in, in the 60s in the party about fascism mm -hmm. as our enemies That's right. are talking about fascism today. That's right. How about well, the well, the fascism they're talking about is Trump's old fascism. Trump is a regurgitation of that old fascism that we had, which of course uh, never died. It's alive in and well and appeals to more than half of the white population of the country right. uh, who voted for him, most of whom are sticking with him right. uh, because and he knows his people so That's well. Right. Right. Uh, they're scared of 2045. That's right. 2045 is when the Census Bureau said uh, no that white white are going to right. be a minority. That's Trump right. is, is standing at the border like George Wallace <laughs> standing yeah. in the schoolhouse door right. saying, oh no, <laughs> not, not on my watch. He's, and, and they take him seriously because they take 2045 seriously. Uh, a, a majority, not white nation, is not America as far as they're concerned. Uh, they believe, as the Founding Fathers believed, as the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed in Dred Scott in 1857, that the United States is a white man's country. That's right. uh, Trump believes that too. Mm -hmm. But half of white America clearly uh, believes that uh, as well. So when we have these conversations about fascism, don't let the new corporate fascists uh, take control of this uh, of this right. discourse right. Uh, and, and seize uh, uh, fascism uh, as their own weapon. That 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 that's that's hellacious to allow uh, these corporate fascists to use fascism right. as a weapon uh, against uh, us. Wow. Uh, uh, Brother Burroughs, when you were talking about uh, Mumia and Vittoria's book as a part of the decolonization process, uh, that, that was wonderful. Uh, we, we need to think of all of the work uh, that we do uh, as, as, as yes. part of the process of eliminating yes. Yes. their stories uh, right. their, their, their narrative, right. uh, their version of reality, right. root and branch. That's right. And that's hard work. That's right. It's a lifetime's work and you yeah. still uh, aren't done. Yeah. Uh, Mumia <laughs> is a disciplined brother. He knows uh, what he's biting off and, and chewing on. Uh, his his co-author, uh, Stephen Vittoria, uh, seems to, seems to uh, have been the person that first conceived of this huge project. Uh, he wanted to do a documentary right. film right. Uh, right. that would show right. the scope of 500 years of European aggression against the rest of the world. Now, God damn. <laughs> there ain't no IMAX right. in the world right. that can accommodate right. that kind of crime. That, that's that, that a, crime that's is some serious good. editing. Oh, man. 20-year <laughs> movie. That is right. So, but I respect his ambitions. Right on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we'd like to do that, but we need a whole bunch of filmmakers and, right on. and uh, like I said, the biggest IMAX uh, in the world uh, to show that. So. Uh, he prudently uh, scaled it down uh, to a three book series in his head and turned to the smartest man that he knew, uh, Ab Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, on whom he had uh, previously done uh, the documentary. Uh, the first book, uh, Dreaming uh, of Empire, uh, it's, I think they approached this, this project uh, totally correctly. Because the first book uh, focuses on and traces uh, the ideological basis of the American empire. This is the story uh, that the aggressor tells. 
to justify his That's right. aggression. That's right. uh, we don't understand uh, the Declaration of Independence if we don't understand that this is an alibi for crimes already committed and crimes that are planned to be committed. In the Declaration of Independence, these colonists uh, uh, claiming to be Democrats, with that small d, uh, said that they are, their beef with the British Empire is that it uh, encouraged uh, the savages, yeah. they, they mean the Native Americans, uh, and also uh, encouraged slave rebellions. Mm -hmm. So here they are giving their motivation away. They want the freedom to suppress the Native Americans, steal their land as much as they could, anywhere they could, and they wanted to be secure in the institution of slavery because already in the uh, British uh, House of Commons, uh, in the British Parliament rather, uh, there, were, there was talk of, if not abolition of slavery, uh, that the great British Navy, Navy ought to take a role in regulating the slave trade. Now the wealthiest men in the colonies, uh, the English speaking colonies, were people like George Washington, who were planters, and George Washington was the wealthiest man in the world. Uh, his 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 his, his main fortune, uh, despite the fact that he uh, had uh, uh, one of the largest uh, populations of slaves uh, in in the country, was as a land speculator. So he needed more land to speculate uh, on, but that was all Indian land, and so he had a problem then with the British uh, saying don't mess with these Indians that we already have treaties uh, with. This was limiting George Washington's ability to become an even uh, richer man. And the other center of wealth in the colonies was in New England uh, with the shipping industry. And the biggest profit making part of the shipping industry was Those the slave ships, trade. That's right. And so, this, so the center of gravity among the rich people, and this was a rich man's uh, revolution. Yes, sir. They shouldn't even use the term revolution. Yes, it was a rich man's uh, 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 rebellion or secession. The center of gravity uh, was based uh, in slavery, and the preservation of those profit centers uh, was what was most important. So this is how uh, the, the, the American lie uh, begins. It's all, as I said, an alibi for crimes committed and uh, crimes uh, that uh, they are planned uh, to be uh, committed. Uh, book two is the one that's uh, just come out. Uh, and it begins with World War I. And I think it's important uh, that it start with World War I. It's, it's about all wars, but it starts in great detail uh, with World War I. And most Americans, black Americans, white Americans, Americans in general, don't know a damn thing about World War I. And, and that really is, uh, is amazing. Uh, people of a certain age like me, uh, your grandparents were uh, born in that era, and yet folks don't know anything uh, about it. Uh, but that was the period uh, in which the, the government apparatus uh, and uh, uh, the shape and, and modern ideology of the ruling class uh, actually uh, took shape. Uh, the, uh, it's true that during uh, periods of, of war, uh, tendencies are acceler accelerated uh, and uh, things that are ephemeral uh, gel <laughs> in, in, in the bat of an eye. That's what happens uh, during periods of war. And so World War I uh, is, is very uh, important. Uh, and Victoria, and uh, Mumia uh, dissect uh, the history of the United States during that period, and they do it masterfully. Uh, the lies that they are dissecting are familiar ones, uh, and it's also a familiar territory for us as they dissect uh, and examine the corporate uh, tactics uh, that coerced a whole country into supporting a war that hardly anybody anybody uh, wanted to uh, enter. All of the antagonists 
in World War I were imperialists. All of them were colonialists. All of them, of course, were white supremacists. Uh, so these rulers uh, in these countries that were fighting each other and wasting millions uh, of lives were based on the labor and the resources of the darker peoples of the world. In fact, uh, in great part, the whole war was about who was going to get uh, the biggest share of the world that was already colonized and those parts of the world that could be colonized uh, further. So, uh, and of course, it was also based on the labor of their own working classes. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson is described to us most often as a liberal, mm -hmm. a liberal Democrat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that means a Clinton Democrat or, mm -hmm. or a Bernie Democrat, uh, but, but what he actually was, uh, was an arch racist, a real Georgia cracker. That's right. right? That's I mean, right. He, he ran Princeton University for a while, but this, this was a Georgia cracker. And when he ran for president in the election of 2016, he ran on a platform of keeping the United States out of war because he knew that almost everybody opposed the U.S. getting into war. But the ruling class of the United States wanted to be a part of this war. All the other imperialists were jousting, and they knew that at the end of this war, there would be a whole new arrangement of the colonial territories and the markets that could be exploited by the various uh, powers. And so it was just unthinkable uh, that the American ruling class would not be part of this. And to get in it, you got to put some, uh, some, uh, some soldiers on the ground, some boots on the ground, mm -hmm. as they uh, say. So <coughs> this supposedly anti-war Democratic president, Woodrow Wilson, became pro-war almost as soon as he got into, into office. Uh, and that's important uh, because uh, some folks will tell you that the current situation uh, in which it is obvious to uh, everybody uh, that what the majority uh, desires almost never uh, becomes law right. in the United States. I mean, we know that, what, what are the supermajority issues uh, in this country? Medicare for all, like 80%. Uh, a decent minimum wage, 90%. Uh, and even a blockade against Cuba. Well, now that's not, that's not part of the... <laughs> <laughs> it ought to be. If it, it's been a decent it. country, it would get it there. Uh, but there are like four yeah. supermajority yeah. uh, issues out there, uh, including a Green New Deal. Right. Uh, that 80 right. to 90 percent of Democrats uh, support and about half of Republicans support. Now these are supposed to be automatic, uh, easy shots uh, to, uh, to move through Congress, and yet they can't move anywhere. And we see only the squad being associated with, with all of those. And Nancy Pelosi saying, oh, there, there, there's only four of them, now we've got the, you know. Because this government does not respond even to overwhelmingly popular demands of the people. Now, however, uh, we're given the impression that, that this is something recent uh, and that it's uh, connected to the uh, increase, the dramatic increase uh, in wealth inequality, that we have uh, three guys, Bezos, Gates, and another one who have as much wealth as like half of the bottom half of the country. That's right. And, That's and right. That, that is, of course, is important. Uh, but no, the United States has never responded uh, legislatively uh, to the wishes and desires of the majority of the people. And, and so it was the same thing in terms of World War I. Uh, uh, when Wilson uh, decided that he would enter the war, uh, he put out the call for a million volunteers. 73,000 men stepped forward. That's like 7%. 93% mm -hmm. short on that. The United States can't get involved in this great European war in which 73,000 people get killed in one battle in one day. 
uh, they can't they, they can't participate with those kinds of numbers and that meant called for the creation of a secret police apparatus that previously had not existed in this Come country. Come the on. FBI Come was on. tiny. J. Edgar right. Hoover worked there, but he didn't have anybody under him. That's right. Their budget was minuscule. That's right. Uh, the federal government had relied on the states uh, to right. do oppression. That's right. Uh, and there's, the states didn't have big intelligence operations. They, they just beat labor leaders and black folks in the head. That's right. It was a very crude thing. Uh, but here in, 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 in almost instantaneously, uh, Woodrow Wilson's government's project uh, is to defeat not just an anti-war movement, but defeat anti-war sentiment right. that represents the overwhelming majority right. Right. of the people, uh, to somehow uh, create an environment in, in which, uh, after the fact, uh, the U.S. public seems to be giving its consent to going into a war that they didn't want to go into. Uh, so the Woodrow Wilson regime uh, marshals 75,000, that's more people than volunteered uh, to go into the military, marshals 75,000 pe people uh, to give speeches uh, on the war, to drum out, uh, to create the illusion of popular uh, support. But of course, uh, that's only uh, a, a, a surface uh, kind of tactic. What they do is they empower the FBI uh, and give it a for its, uh, for an institution uh, a new uh, counterintelligence uh, mission, and they vastly empower the one agency in the United States that had always had a counterintelligence capacity, and that is Army Intelligence. And Army Intelligence went out and they tried to recruit everybody into their ranks, including black people. They went to W.E.B. Du Bois, who at this time was editor of the crisis and big wig in the NAACP, and they offered him a position as an army officer, that's who army intelligence was, as an army officer uh, in the intelligence service, uh, as a captain. Du Bois didn't think that that was a high enough rank for him, and so he uh, demanded that he be made a major. A and so they went back and forth on that and for a few months and finally both parties, Du Bois and military intelligence, uh, felt better, uh, felt differently about it. Uh, and so it was never consummated, which is very good. I was very fortunate that that happened because that really would have killed W.E.B. E. B. Du Bois's reputation. <laughs> That's right. We wouldn't be talking about him in such glowing terms uh, if he had taken the captaincy right. or the major uh, ship. Uh, but that's what was what was going on. They were they were making out, almost out of uh, whole cloth uh, this uh, police uh, state, uh, and the U.S. had to do this uh, in order to become a top player in the global imperial game, and at the same time uh, to present itself as the unique player in the imperial game. Uh, that is, that had a uh, bourgeois democratic form of government that supposedly responds to the wishes of the masses. Well, the masses don't agree with that kind of warlike foreign policy, therefore you have to go through these extraordinary uh, measures uh, creating and strengthening new organizations, that is, uh, the uh, national security state, maybe make it out of whole cloth if you don't have a functional one uh, in order to get what Noam Chomsky calls and others have called uh, uh, to manufacture consent uh, to the war. And, and that was the project uh, that was going on that was initiated uh, during uh, World War I. So, so we can see how ambitious uh, even this small section, this, just the first section of book two uh, right. by Victoria and Mumia really is. When you look at that period, uh, then our current situation uh, becomes much clearer. Uh, we, we see similarities, uh, but we understand also uh, that, that, uh, that this apparatus 
didn't always exist in the country and had to be uh, laboriously uh, put together. I also have to say, since we're talking about Woodrow uh, Wilson, uh, that as the arch racist uh, that he was, uh, he had an unfinished uh, mission uh, as well, uh, not just to get the country into a war that it didn't want to get into, but to finish the mission of killing Reconstruction. Right. Now, in 1916, right. uh, Reconstruction right. certainly was dead uh, within the South itself, and black folks, uh, by and large, could not vote, and uh, the reign of terror uh, was just well, about total. That's right. But the 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 uh, federal bureaucracy was integrated. Uh, there had been, you know, Republicans and Democrats play tag team, uh, and the uh, vestiges of the deep connection that the Republican Party used to have uh, with black folks, uh, the vestiges of that were uh, appointments of black postmasters, uh, and since all the federal bureaucracy was really patronage jobs that were distributed politically, uh, black folks got, got jobs in the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and those were integrated workplaces. Well, Wilson said, no, we're going to finish the job of killing Reconstruction and all this uplift Negro stuff. And he imposed uh, segregation on the federal service, civil service. So Woodrow Wilson uh, needs to be included as like the last act of post-Reconstruction. We ought to go from 1877 uh, with the Hayes-Tilden Compromise right, right, right. to 1916 right. uh, with the last nail in the coffin uh, being put in by Woodrow Wilson. And, and, and the, the, this is the kind of, of rewriting uh, that, uh, of history uh, that needs uh, to, to go on. Uh, we've got to dissect uh, the monster's whole body. I'm talking about the monster of capitalist rule of the rich. Uh, and, and the police are just one aspect of our oppression. Uh, of necessity, <coughs> many of us in this room uh, focus on uh, the crimes of the police. We, we have to. Uh, we wish we had uh, more company uh, and we could resist the police uh, even, even more energetically. Uh, but the police are just the tip of the spear exactly. of, this, of this whole monstrous uh, apparatus. <coughs> uh, here we have a political prisoner uh, who was framed by the police, uh, a prisoner of a criminal injustice system that has tried over and over again uh, to kill him. And yet he takes this panoramic look, not just at the mass black incarceration state, but the whole state of affairs under capitalism. And that encourages us to have that kind of vision. Because if we have the narrow vision, we let so much get mm -hmm. past us. Uh, they have legions of think tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, all of their uh, operatives, all of their cadre are paid, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. None of ours are paid, mm -hmm. you see. So they're working all the time. And that means that we have to work uh, all the time. And, and so once again, uh, Mumia provides, provides a model uh, for how we uh, are supposed to uh, serve the people. Thank you. By the way, some Jersey history. Oh, Mr. Wilson, may he rest in peace. Shout out the movie Birth of a Nation at the White House. 1915, when Birth of a Nation was debuted. At the White House. Those of you who are students of film should appreciate that Birth of a Nation is the beginning of the expanse of American cinema and the capacity of the American empire to project itself onto the world with white supremacy like no one else, yeah. right? And it codified every horrific stereotype of our people that we have ever dealt with. And we are still trying to undo ourselves from that, right? Woodrow Wilson, while folks were in East Orange, 
were marching against the birth of a nation. I'm talking about New Jersey, 1915. You need to know your own history right here in this racist up South state, right? Woodrow Wilson was hosting a major sh private showing of all prominent white supremacists of why that's so important and uh, why that film must be saluted and celebrated. So have no illusions of inclusion when it comes to that cracker, may he rest in peace. Um, <laughs> before I bring Pam up, right, we have been trying to get D on the line. What's the, what's the latest with that? Bilal, you just walked in. We got him? Do we have him? Okay, yeah, we have been trying to do that. So while we're doing it, let me just do this real quick, right? Uh, yeah, we, we got it, we got, we, we got it, okay? And so you right on time, Bilal, right on. I said, I'm going to and all power to the people, beloved. Right, another one of the Rupert's Cubs, right? So you gonna, you sorry, but you're going to interrupt me anyway? <laughs> this is Patrice Barnwell, one of the co-owners of, of Retorsa Dow. Give us some love. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do this because we, you know, this, all that we're doing is in the context of political prisoner solidarity, right? Y'all see this big post of Imam Jamil? Yes. Right? Did y'all know that Imam Jamil just had a stroke? Okay, no. so we got to fix that. Yeah, we got to deal with that. Right? 75 years old, it's in one of the worst prisons in the United States, right? We got to deal with that, right? So this, this, this is a, this is a working meeting, y'all. I want y'all to understand that over and over again. We in Jersey, we got to turn it up for Sundiata. That's right. Okay, right. we got to turn it up for Sundiata. So I'm gonna read uh, one of the Sada's pieces from a bunch of books. There's a book called "Look for Me in the World" when that was redone and dedicated to Sundiata. All right, and this is one of the Sada's pieces. I got to take my glasses off so I could. Now, see what I'm doing is we just say in P-Funk land. I'm from Plainfield, right, land? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Poem for Sundiata. And this is dedicated to Sundiata, to Mumia, to Imam Jamil. I remember your smile, bright as the sun's explosions, wide as the arms of Yemaya, deep as a gushing well of kindness. I remember your smile, slow like the dawn of recognition, quick like the wit of observation, clear as the log logic of common sense. I Remember your smile. Frank as a simple declaration, bold like the taste of naked love. Wasn't no grinning or smirking or sneering. I remember your smile. Even when you were young, you had an old smile. Deep wrinkles spread across your brow like worn paths crossing familiar ground. Laugh lines descending from eyes made old by deadly images. Laughter holding back the tears. I remember your smile. Your smile is like an umbilical cord pulling me back, pulling us back to a lost continent of brown velvet faces with white incandescent teeth radiating home, radiating peace, radiating love. Your smile wakes me up from nightmares turned into daymares, reoccurring slave mares in the twisted tinsel hell they call America. When they came and they took my baby, when the milk in my breast turned to sour curds, when there was no one there to hold me and the voices that tried to console me sounded like empty words, I remembered your smile. Rolled off of our loves with reams of papers, stained with filthy, greedy lies, turned us into prison statistics using legalese linguistics, regurgitating hip hypocritical diatribes like thin white vomit in the midst of body bags and toe tags and the flood of black blood, in the midst of affirmative negation and mass extermination, I remember your smile. We remember your smile. We call on your smile to give us life. They have been trying to take your smile, wipe it off your face like they've been wiping us off of this earth. But you smile, that smile in cages, institutionalized outrages. 20 year hits like contemptuous spit in, a spite of, in spite of a bitter taste in your mouth, your smile shines strong. All of us smile 
lovers need to set you free. We need to free your smile, that x-ray smile, beaming rays of freedom. Unchain that smile. Set it free. We love your smile. We need your smile. Your smile is sweet enough to melt hard hearts into love syrup, sweet and sticky as the nectar of freedom. We got to free that smile. Unchain that smile. Let it shine out and warm us. I want to see that smile make children laugh and light up a woman's eyes at midnight. We got to free that smile, that freedom smile, so we can all smile again. One cannot be, <laughs> one cannot be a revolutionary without strong feelings of love, Che Guevara, right? That's right. That is a sada on her comrade Sundi Atta that we share now for Mumia, Imam Jamil, and Sundi Atta again. We're still trying to get we just still trying to get it together in the back. Well let's do this. Let's let's what we're trying to do that. Let's uh, Pam as I get ready to bring you up I got to got to just just you know make this real and plain, right? This is this even though this is a, 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 a an incredible feat by any stretch of the imagination. If Mumia were out here in the streets with us, this is an arduous, incredible task that requires a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work. But where is he? Let's, let's, let's let us not get it twisted. Let us not miss this dimension. He is in, the, he, he is in captivity. He is in the bowels of a prison system fighting for his very sight. You want to see volume three, right? We got to sweat the state of Pennsylvania. We got to bum rush the Department of Corrections. The date is, right. is July 24th. 24. We gonna take a ride. ride. We gonna take a ride right. into the face of the Department of Corrections. You gonna give him his medical care. We gonna take your goddamn pants down. You gonna stop playing with our freedom fighters. You want to see volume three? Huh? You want to see volume three? Put the pressure on that fake liberal governor. What that crackers? What's his name? What's the governor of Pennsylvania? Motherfucker. Motherfucker. You heard the minister of complication. What's his name? What's his other name? Wolf. Oh, yes, right. Wolf. Oh, yeah. Go, oh, yeah. His mama and his daddy gave him the right name. Wolf. <laughs> Can't make this up. Right? We got to turn it. You want to be free? Right? You want Sundi out of smile? We got to turn it up. That's right. Their freedom, their lives are not in the hands of the clutches of their masters. They're in our hands. We have to see ourselves that serious. We have to see ourselves as being the ones that are going to be the ultimate difference makers. We got to see ourselves as ones able to figure out how cell phones work. <laughs> and I was getting ready to bring her up as, they, as, as she had to take that call. Yes, sir. You ready, baby? <laughs> yeah, right. My big sister, the Minister of Confrontation, y'all give it up for Pan Africa. The time is come. We on the move. Okay. On the move, family. On the move. It's really good seeing you. I got really good information for you. And uh, we're not without, we're constantly winning, we're constantly gut putting these suckers down to, could you pass these out? This is information um, on where Mumia's case is at now. And there's also information about the um, trip to Mechanicsburg and uh, to confront these people about Mumia's health. Mumia's not blind right now, okay? A um, couple weeks ago, and I'm saying, Mumia would not be alive if it wasn't for the people. That's right. Mm -hmm. The right. power Make it plain. of the people. Make it plain. Mumia had been battling for his life and for the life of people around him, inside and out, for over 37 years. And the way we are able to fight and bring Mumia home is because he stands firm on what's happening to him in the prison when he tried to kill him. I went to the prison with Ozzie Davis one day and when we came from out there, 
Ozzy hunched me. He said, you know what I just saw, Pam? I said, what? He said, I saw a free man on death row. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, indeed. Absolutely. We did see a free man on death row. Because these people had tried every way they can you know, to break Mumia. Mm -hmm. But they can't do it. Can't do it. Everybody knew when Mumia had the hepatitis C and a battle to get him the cure. It was a battle that people kept saying we couldn't win. They told us that about him on death row. They told us about Tookie. They told us about um, Shaka Sankofa. We was all a part of them battles. That's right. People said if um, Shaka dies, there's gonna be fire in the sky. Tookie died. It's going to be fire in the sky. I cut this thing off. You <laughs> 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 can't see this piece. This is Noel. This is Noel. I want to uh, tell her all about it. She probably want to tell you good information that we already know. But um, none of that stuff happened. None of that stuff happened. There was no fire in the sky. And all Mumia dies, if um, Shaka dies, and all what we were going to do, because we're talking about innocent people, innocent people, and all you know who, with all the evidence for us, they killed them. They beat Shaka and Kofa unmercifully because he refused to just walk in there and accept what they said they was going to do. He said, they're going to have to drag me out of here and I'm going down fighting. And they beat him so bad, they had to take him back, patch him up, and bring him back again. Mm -hmm. And he said to the world, look what they're doing to me. I did. I was over in Cuba and um, invited over here by um, Brother Fidel Castro. Yes, right. Over long there live, with Sada. Long live. Long live. Long live. And, um, Shaka Sankofa had asked me to take to the streets of Philadelphia if something went down with him. And I was asked by Minister, oh, Minister, by Brother Fidel Castro and all to stay for two more weeks, for two weeks over there. But a commitment is a commitment. We took to the streets and we turned Philadelphia out. And uh, a lot of people was upset. And uh, they were saying, you can't say that to, me, to uh, Fidel Castro. If he asked you to stay, you're supposed to stay. But I got the respect of the brother because it was a principal thing that we can deal with, we was dealing with here. I can come back. But Shaka Sankofa only had that one chance and he asked that we do this. The support over there was magnificent for Mumia. Um, where his case is at right now is not in the hands of this government. He's in our hands. That's right. He's in That's our right. hands. That's right. I want to tell you about different judges who was involved in what's been happening with Mumia. Some people forgot about things. When they took the right from Mumia to write a book. The first one was Live from Death Row. That's the first one everybody know about. Mumia wrote another one with Before a small that. group of yeah. people. Yeah. And um, that one is not out. We're trying to get that republished. Um, losing train of thought here. Okay. And uh, but oh, here's what I'm talking about the judges. Well, Mumia's case went to Harrisburg because what was happening, Mumia was getting ready to go up. They was going to deal with whether they were signed a death warrant. But he had wrote a book, and he got thrown in the hole. TV taken away from him. No papers. No nothing that he could have. And um, Mumia filed the suit that went to federal court in Harrisburg. Not only did they take his right to write a book, another book, and all uh, because it was too late, the other one was, the first one was out, and all, uh, but they were taking Mumia's legal papers and were sending them to the governor. 
we in court dealing with that. This judge ruled in Mumia's favor. They took him off a of death row. He got wound up with the right to write, a, write his books again. But how did that happen? The power of the people. Right. Because when you took Mumia's rights away, and you didn't take everybody else's rights away, your prejudice was clear and it was showing. So what they had to do, they had to give Mumia rights, not because they wanted to do the right thing, but because when these politicians go to jail, they write books. And uh, so, you know, the uh, journalistic people, you know, got involved in what was happening all the way across the board. People got involved in because this was a danger to them as well. So they backed down off of it. And, uh, and I just want to say, because people always say, you know, that that judge did the right thing, but not without us, That's right. That's right. That's right. the power of the people. Right. And uh, because we had to consistently go at them every day in Harrisburg. That courtroom was filled every day, and it wasn't in Harrisburg, it was Pittsburgh. Every day. They had no idea that a movement for this black man on death row that's accused of killing a white cop was that big. But when you hit at Mumia and you hit at the issues, people who wasn't involved had to get involved because this was going to destroy them as well. So we won that one as well too. Then to come up, you know, with a few other things. Is that my phone? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. When Mumia had hepatitis C and hold up. There was one more before that. Back in court again with Mumia. He did a speech at Goddard College. Yes. And when he did that speech at Goddard College, yes. Yes. he was also he also went to Goddard College. That's right. But these uneventful people did not know that wasn't Mumia's first speech at Godly College. It wasn't his first speech at a lot of colleges. Mumia spoke at Yale, he spoke at Princeton, he spoke at Catholic high schools as a commencement speaker. And all. But these uneventful people, these jealous people heard that he spoke at Godly. Do you know how many people was there? Take a guess in that classroom. And this thing went around the world. It sure did. About 25. Mm -hmm. Small class invited him. But this whole thing went around the world. So what they decided that right. they were going to do was stop Mumia from speaking, period. They had the governor come in, and uh, they had all the cops and people that came in that wanted to resist Mumia speaking. Again, we won that, but during the time that was going on, Mumia had already gotten sick. Mumia had blew up three times his size. He was itching every day, 24 hours a day, and I can't say it enough, his ear was coming off his face. And uh, he was put in the hospital on the day that we won the verdict. The, that Mumia could speak. I mean, he can write for commencement uh, things. And again, when they did that, they had the nerve of other people. So people joined in that fight who didn't even know Mumia. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, they're finding out about Mumia. But when you find out about Mumia and the people who are speaking out against it, a lot of people know Glenn Ford. But when this thing here happened with Mumia, that voice was on the front line. A lot of sisters know you, brothers know you, 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 pop, people inside here. They know, and this thing just went everywhere. The power of the people. Right on, right on. That day, we won, the day that we won a decision for Mumia, we celebrating in there, get a phone call from Johanna, and she said they just rushed Mumia to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Like what? We was only a half an hour away. But I'm telling you, we had a full courtroom People on the outside, so when they said they rushed Mumia to the hospital, and because uh, someone on the inside told Johanna, and it's not something that they do, that's security, you don't know this. And uh, But the powers that be 
told her about what was happening with Monia. So a whole group of us, by the time we got there, Johanna and them knew exactly where Mumia was at. So we all come in here little by little, next thing you know, we done took over the whole waiting room upstairs where Mumia was at. We didn't know that we on this side of the wall and Mumia's on the other. We was not disruptive or anything. They allowed us to stay. We had one of the biggest press conferences up there. Um, I can't think of the name of this all white county, this racist county where they had Momia at. They hid Momia out. Momia was almost into a diabetic coma. We could have lost Momia. Right. We find out that they got Momia strapped to the bed. Both hands, his feet. Momia was itching. 24 hours, seven days a week. His skin was like black leather. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, you couldn't see no pores, and all. But when it would breathe, it would. You know how a fish out of water when it breathes, you can see on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's how Mumia's skin was, right? We found this stuff out, and uh, we put it out there to the world, and the world reacted. And uh, they tried, they brought, they kept Mumia there for a while, and. Then they started working on him. They released those cuffs from Mumia. Mumia was so sick, he said when he went to the bathroom, and uh, you know, when they let him out to go to the bathroom, these guards knew he couldn't walk. And uh, he said, but he's trying to walk. And let me tell you about Mumia's feet. And uh, his sneakers, his feet was so swollen that he had to cut the back and cut the sides so he can slip the tip of his toes in there. And uh, they gave him some um, flip flops, and uh, and his feet was so swollen that after a while he couldn't get it in there in the shoes. Mumi was in bad shape. These people was hell bent on killing Mumia, but again, we won out because we managed to get the necessary medicines for Mumia, and people kept telling us. You know, see this whole thing where people always going by what lawyers say, what judges say, what politicians say. They said you will never be able to get him this pill, the cure, not the maybe cure, the could be cure, the cure for hepatitis C, which was $1,000 a pill and you had to take it 90 days. They said, you know, if you get it for him, you're going to get it, you have to get it for everybody. Exactly. Well, that's what we was about. That's right. It wasn't that's just right. Mumia. That's right. Those are our brothers, that's our right. sisters, that's our right. mothers, that's our right. fathers in there. So we fighting for them all. That's, that's right. what we were doing. The battle was so magnificent. That's right. Make it clear. That when we went into the courtroom up in what is Scranton. that damn racist Scranton, Scranton right. people mm -hmm. were saying, that ain't Philadelphia. You know, what the hell did that mean to us? Mm -hmm. It ain't Philadelphia. I remember when they took our kids down south, and um, when we went down there in Virginia, they, I never heard the word Jim Crow. They said, this is, you can't do that, this is Jim Crow. I'm like, well, who the hell was he? <laughs> you know, I didn't know who he was. I really didn't. Had never heard the right. term Jim Crow, mm -hmm. you know? But one thing I did know, if Jim Crow stood in between us and our children, we would we have to meet. Ass. That's right. We never met that motherfucker. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, right. We that's never right. met him. That's right. And uh, you know, if he exists, I mean, you know, and, and people say he exists, but we have never met him. And uh, he's hiding in the background uh, somewhere. But anyway, with Mumia, during that court appearance in Scranton, we filled the courtroom on the inside, and I've never seen a courtroom that big in my life. It must have been, had seating for about 150 or maybe more in people. The outside was full of people. The inside was full of people. And you know what? You don't know what you don't know until you get to, because everybody was talking about this, you know, how, you know, we won't have to battle with white people. I'm saying we do that every fucking day. Right, right, you know, right, ain't right. no difference. Yeah, but you know, if, if, if some of the blacks up there, they not going to speak up. Well, wasn't so. And of the Negroes we had to fight, you know, we just put some strong information. And when you saw that power, 
that power of the people mm -hmm. who wouldn't bend down, who wouldn't stand. And then we had this judge, this judge who the Department of Correction said that they did not want Mumia in the courtroom. So the judge arranged for Mumia to be in jail but a big screen right, right. with Mumia on it. Right. And uh, they fought it, they fought it, and they couldn't. This was the first time Mumia was seen in a court atmosphere in about 15, right. 15 right. years. Right. Right. What we learned in that courtroom, because we had a judge who dealt with the color of law, the color of law, he demanded that Mumia be brought in. The DA, the Department of Correction said, okay, he didn't spoke, get him out. The judge said, but this is his trial. He got to stay in. He got to be here throughout the whole trial. And I'm telling you, you know people was mesmerized, including the ju judge, by Mumia. But they were also mesmerized by a black brother from New York, a former panther by the name of Joseph Harris. Doctor. That's Doctor right. That's Joseph right. Harris. That's right. And all uh, who went to Doctors Without Borders. He was all over Africa. He was all over everywhere. We didn't know. We knew Mooney was very, very sick. And we everybody was theorizing because the doctors in the prison wasn't saying what. Right. We don't know what the cause of right. it is. This brother visited Mumia and he looked at Mumia. He, he right said he got down. hepatitis C. Uh -huh. Everybody said, he said, I've seen it in Africa. I know what it is that I'm talking about. This brother, brilliant, mm -hmm. wrote the paperwork up. We filed him, we got in court, Mumia was there, this brother was here, and you got the DOC, DOC and, uh, and its doctors who had lied and who had actually did things to prevent Mumia from getting that hepatitis C cure. When we first found out Mumia had hepatitis C, we found out that the very tip of his liver was calcified. And might I add, during all of this, Mumia was still writing. Mumi Never was stopped. still no. writing, doing all of this. Mm -hmm. In the courtroom, it was exposed that the first court that had Mumia's case that turned it down, dealing with this hepatitis C, was lied to by the prison officials. This judge demanded to see everything. Then. When they turned it down, Mumia appealed to another court. That's where we was at in federal court with this judge up in Scranton. When Bob Ball, who was Jeruba Ben Wahad's lawyer, who was also the lawyer of Baltimore. Marshall Eddie Conway. Marshall Eddie Conway. See, we get by with our families. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Marshall Eddie Conway, he was Mumia's lawyer with a new kid on the block who got our brother, uh, Teresa Schultz, Russell Maroon Schultz, off of uh, our solitary right. confinement after years after years and successfully right. sued the government. That's right. These two brothers was on the case with Dr. Harris. We had a dream team, okay? When they went to, oh, this is, this is something that we, we are, had observed and you gotta uh, understand, we outside, and we see these white men arguing. And on this other white man, you know, he walked away from them. They trying to catch up with him, you know, but this was their business. So we going about us, but you, you had to notice this. When we got in the courtroom and Bob asked what we found out, the man that was getting away from them and they was trying to catch up with him, he was the one who, what Bob Bull said, um, Dr. So-and-so and all, is this your paper? Is this your statement? And all, uh, um, did you sign this? Do you ever see this before? He said, um, I saw it, but I didn't sign it. This was another thing where they was trying to stop Mumia. Since he didn't go along with them, they signed his name on it oh, and they wow. submitted him. And they was trying to force him to do things their way. But when he was on the stand, Bob was like, Maybe I got the wrong paper. And the guy, he said, this isn't your signature? He said, no, I didn't sign that. He said, but they tried to get me to sign it. I refused to sign it because it wasn't true. 
and all. That was saying that Mumia was not, you know, sick like they said he was. All this stuff was exposed in jail. And again, the power of the people, power of the people, inside the courtroom, outside the courtroom, in the bigger courtroom, around the world, and uh, was putting this information out there about what was happening to Mumia, this judge took a stand. And what he wound up saying was that Mumia is eligible for that cure. They tried to fight, oh, this is the shit. We had been trying for two years to get the protocol right. for hepatitis C. Right. The Department of Correction was refusing to give the inmates the protocol. He was refusing to give the state representatives the protocol. But see, they didn't have to fight in them to get it. And, oh, you know, if they say, oh, no, we're not doing that, then it's, oh, no, they just go on to the next thing. But we had this one state representative, which is Vanessa Brown, a woman. Yes, yes. A woman. Yes. A mother. That's right. A mother. Yes. A fighter. Good job. And uh, That's right. she kept fighting to get it, and they refused to give it to her, too. But she didn't stop. She was putting it out there to everybody. This day, when Bull asked to see the protocol, the um, DOC said, no, we're not giving it to you. The judge said, what? And uh, he says, no, you got to get, he says, I told the judge, he'll give it to him. But he would not give it to the lawyers. He said, oh, no, you can give it to the lawyers. He said, well, we're not, it's not for distribution. He said, this is public property. Everybody's going to get it. So they hand it to the judge, and the judge sitting there, he looking at it. He looked at them, take a recess. He came back to give them a chance to redo this. What the protocol said that in order for you to get hepatitis C cure, 60% of your liver, liver has to be calcified. Had to be calcified. Mm. Wow. You had to be bleeding from the esophagus. That's right. Wow. The That's blood, right. the veins in your chest, the veins in your body had to be, look, and then if you was too sick, you couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. This is what people had to go through. This is why people were actually dying, the ambulance constantly coming, coming, coming. And the brothers were saying that how you can tell somebody had hepatitis C because they would get yuck and giants. Mm -hmm. You had men walking around there looking like black cats with your eyes. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and, and it was spooky because they disease. didn't know That's what right. it was. Uh -huh. They did not mm -hmm. know what it was. You had, had men had and women, and even on the streets, That's I found right. this out yeah. in Pittsburgh. Come on, come on. Come on. And uh, that people were walking around with this young and Jonas, and they didn't really know what it was, but they were dying. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh had the largest um, thing, um, thing on um, this hepatitis C. Through that battle for Mumia, when it got, when, when it got finished, the, uh, when the judge said that, you know, he was granting it that Mooney get the hepatitis C cure, the DOC said, well, we appeal on it. And he said, you can do what you want. He said, but he won't get the cure now because it's necessary. He got the cure and um, the cure for hepatitis C, but side effects. When they brought it to him, they said to him, well, Mooney, we got good news and we got bad news. The good news is you're going to get the hepatitis C. The bad news is you got cirrhosis of the liver. Mm. Mumia said everything in here dropped because he knew what that means. The itching never stopped. They gave Mumia some medicine um, that eased the itching. And uh, he was cured of the hepatitis C within the 90 days that they said. And all uh, but the side effects of them not giving him the cure. And all uh, Mumia has not stopped itching to this day. In fact, Mumia got a thick patch of black skin right here, about this color here. And he said, when he touches it, it hurts. And he got a scratch. And he said, Pam, he said, I'll be digging. I'll be digging. He's digging at himself because the itch is just that bad. Every day, Mumia takes Vaseline and puts from his head to his toe in every crack four times a day. He used four jars of Vaseline to ease the itch, to ease the itch. 
This is the man that wrote these books. This is the man who write these commentaries. This is the man who stands up to these people. I mean, he's living in the bowels of the belly of That's the right. beast. That's right. And this free man. That's right. And all this is done to stop him from bringing people together like this. Because that's what he's doing around the world. Where Mumi is at now, one of the side effects of the uh, glauc um, the uh, cirrhosis is glaucoma. Mumia now has glaucoma. And we had decided to go up to this prison and deal with it. It's a lot of stuff in between there. And all uh, you know, because what we have is the evidence from this judge. We have the evidence from the prison of what, you know, how they lied and manipulated papers. For two years, we battling with these motherfuckers. We battling with them. When we got cirrhosis of the lip, the situation is still the same. And these people were saying, die, nigga, die. Mm -hmm. Rap Brown wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Die, nigga, die. But still he rise. Still he rise to fight for the lives of people around the world. So, April the 20th, no, July 24th, we're going up to the prison. And we're going to confront them. Last night we doing a speaking engagement in New York with my sisters after 41 years. Janet and Janine home, Africa are Standing free. strong, That's standing right. firm, That's right. doing nothing no different when the, they came to Moo's house with bulldozers, throwing hand grenades into the house and uh, shooting 500,000 <coughs> 500, rounds <coughs> of yeah, ammunition right. into five. the house, right. water deluge hoses on every part while my family is down in the basement and uh, they were tearing the house down on top of them, beating people in the community that resisted what they were doing. And uh, you know, my sister Janet and Janine is home because they followed the strategy of John Africa. That's to be the consistent and persistent. I ain't left one here. Because these sisters right. and these brothers fought inside that prison, right. educating people while we was educating on the outside, while y'all was sending information on the inside about what was happening with Mumia and other people. And the fact that there's a lawsuit. Everybody, every man, woman, and child in these prisons can get the hepatitis C cure, but people didn't know. They knew about it in California. They knew about it in Ohio because people had got the cure. But people in Philadelphia, because of politicians, and people were supposed to be on top of these things, loving our brothers and sisters inside these prisons, didn't see the importance of, and some people was like, you know, there go Mumia, because they wanted him to join a class action suit that had already been a year and a half in the thing. So he chose to go on his own because we could move it fast. And also, we had control over what was happening and had to make people understand that this wasn't just for Mumia, this was for everybody. A year and a half after Mumia won the suit and people was getting it, the class action suit was won for everybody. But you know how many lives were saved in between there? Mm -hmm. Talk about thousands. Thousands of lives. That's right. So um, Mumia had wrote this thing. Noelle Hanahan had interviewed, went up to see him. She said, Mumia, what's it like to have glaucoma and cataracts? And Mumia said, picture this put a dark pair of shades on and take some Vaseline and rub on both glass or both lenses. That's what I see. She said she was messed up. She was really messed up. And you put that information out. And then Mumia wrote a, Mumia never talks about Mumia. Never talks about Mumia. He always talks about, about everybody else. That's right. So when Mumia wrote this commentary, about what was happening with him and describing to people what <coughs> was happening to him, how it feels to not only be going blind, but he got all these other things happening to him at the same time. Mumia mentors brothers in the prison. 
he have classes in the prison while he's going through all of this, writing all these different things. So um, last week he wrote another commentary. And he didn't talk about this. He talked about Janet Janine. He talked about a whole lot of other things. But Mumia thinking about how can I best help myself? He said, the steroids that they've given me, I'm not going to take these steroids any longer. Mumia can see as far as from here, Suzanne Ross went to visit him, and as she came in the doors, like where you come in the doors there, Mumia saw her. He saw her. He actually saw people in the visiting room. And when you're inside that prison, you don't let people know that you're vulnerable. Right. Because I remember when Mumia you up. was coming in, um, when he had that hepatitis C, I see. I said, damn, Mumia's gliding across that floor. I mean, he's gliding. I said, hey, Mumia. I'm saying, damn, that is awesome. I said, you just glide on in here. He said, if I put my feet down too hard, he said, the pain, the pain. And uh, so when he was walking, looked like he was he was trying to keep that pressure off his, off his feet. And he mm -hmm. said, and you cannot let people know mm -hmm. how vulnerable you are. But here's the good thing about people in the prison, men in the prison. People don't talk about how these brothers mentor, love, and care for each other. They have to be the mother that holds them, the father that gives them information and stuff. Mummy was sitting in the wheelchair. They had him so messed up. His thighs was huge, his feet was. This brother looked at Mumia. He said, you getting up out of here. Mummy said, I can't. He said, yes, you can. Mummy said he picked him up like a baby every day. He said, something make him walk real slow, was holding him up. And uh, he looked at Mumia's skin, he says, the doctors in the hospital told Mumia, you know, whatever you do, you want to take a bath, and you know, don't break that skin. You bathe in very lukewarm water. Mumia was doing that. This brother told Mumia, he says, I'm going to sit you in that tub as, with the water as hot as it is. And he said, because you're under there. You're under there. He scrubbed Mumia, and Mumia said it was so damn painful. He scrubbed his body. He said, now there's one part you're going to have to do by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he taught Mumia to take care of himself. And uh, by the time they got that far, and Mumia was walking, he was walking, y'all, he was walking. And, uh, and the skin was clearing up. The monsters dig it. What they did, they transferred the brother. Mm -hmm. Right. Another right. great story about brothers in prison. Right. Razakhan, what's that brother's name? Major Tillery. Right, right. Major right. Tillery. Right. When Mumia first got sick like this, them keep talking about the power of people inside and out. The power of people locked behind them bars. Major Ain't Tillery no power the like the power of people right. when the power of people, people don't, don't stop. stop. That's right. Major looked and he said, yo, Mumia. Mumia didn't know he was huge. He didn't. You know, this is how messed up he was. He said, you got to get to a hospital. Next thing you know, the warden of the prison, the hierarchy of the prison, was walking down the hall with his, you know, self. So Major steps to him, he says, Mumia need to be in the hospital. He need to be in there now. And uh, not, he wasn't asking. He was telling them and he was demanding. So this man gets all messed up and he said, you mind your business. He said, Mumia is my business. And that echoed with other male inmates of all colors, of all nationality. Mumia is our business. They got rid of Major Tillery. They got rid of the doctor who helped Mumia. But it was too late by then. What happened, the doctor, he was someplace else helping other people. But Tillery, they wound up putting him in the hole. Still in the old today, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're fighting that battle. Uh, Rachel Wolkenstein is his attorney now, and she's doing an excellent job. That's right. Rachel's a warrior. Yes, she's right. a warrior. That's right. She's a warrior, like her That's or right. not. That's right. And uh, this woman is committed That's to right. put the information right. out. She's right. not one of them lawyers that like to use pretty words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Call spades spades. That's right. Mm -hmm. They say a lot of people say her stuff is too rough. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you can't say it like that. Why not? You uh, <laughs> know, Glenn Ford, for a lot of people, they say he's too raw. Mm -hmm. You can't say it yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. You got to get it so that people can understand it. Because if you go on talking and telling people what's well, really wrong, <laughs> you know, but people wanted to hear. But um, yesterday was a victory. And uh, um, Mumia, the, um, the prison, and there's lawyers and stuff, filed the appeal. And uh, you know, to stop Mumia from getting the hepatitis C cure. Three panel judge, was they federal? Yeah. Three panel federal judge, three judges, ruled that what they did to Mumia was absolutely wrong. They should have gave him that medicine. They were the cause of Mumia being sick. That's right. We all, go ahead. That's right. The treatment. That they purposely prevented Mumia from getting the treatment. You know why they did that? Because the eyes of the world was on them. Not only was the eyes of the world on them, but the eyes of people who would step to them and do the damn damn. We ran the governor out of his home in Harrisburg. We ran the governor out of his mansion there. He would duck and hide and run. And uh, he had this big, beautiful office that he was never at in Philadelphia. And people were saying, we need to go to Harrisburg. Well, you know what Harrisburg looked like, the Capitol. It's all them. It's those politicians that, you know, when you come there with your problems, they all stand there and smile with the picture, you know, like they done did something. They done did something? Mm -hmm. No, they didn't. Only one, only one, Vanessa Brown, came to the forefront and stood with us. But these judges, yesterday the decision came down. We're planning on going up there. And see, we're stating very clearly, Mumi got to be released from this hell hole because they are definitely trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. Without, you know, some people say, you know, you say that, but you don't have no backup. When the judge says you purposely withheld the, um, the, um, met the treatment, and as a result, Mumia is here, a black judge by the name of Tucker, That's right. Leon Tucker, That's right. shot the oh, shit out of him. A Republican us. black judge. A oh Republican black judge. When Mumia was in court, as I look through here, I see a many of us, mm -hmm. you know, who stood there and battled when things was going wrong. We made sure that they went right. When this judge made his decision, he made his decision in favor of Mumia. Again, that's the power of the people. Mm -hmm. So when people tell you what you can't do, because every one of these what you can't do. Oh, you can't do this. You won't get Mumia off of death row. Oh, you won't do this and you won't do that. You know, as long as we stay consistent That's right. and That's persistent right. and Mumia maintain his grounds, need to we can do house. anything. That's right. When That's we right. lose is when we politicians get involved. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of times when lawyers get involved, because yep, yep, yep. they want to tell you, no, you can't, you know, don't speak on this, mm -hmm. and oh, this will harm the case, don't do that. Lawyers should stay in their place and let the movement do what it is exactly. that we do. Exactly. And uh, you know, and together, together, we can gut punch these motherfuckers. That's right. But we can't do it with this one over here and that one over here and that one's right there. All the prison organizations, we all came together and all the youth came together. When we started this thing with Mumia, a lot of the people that worked with you, they were teenagers. Right. Right. There's fathers and <laughs> you know they right got their there. daughters that right dancing. Yes, teenager. TJ. He's a, baby. That's He's right. a teacher That's teaching right. it That's right. in the colleges. Ain't no power like the power of the people. people. The power right. of people don't and when stop. you teach and you be a part of a movement where you see that you, you got win. And not only that, show where you fighting these people and bringing, I mean, generations of people today. I mean, the FOP done said, you know, they don't understand how 
We have as many people fighting for Mumia today as we had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Power the people. So the 24th, we need as many people as we can. We're going up to the Department of Correction and, are, and we're presenting this evidence as well. And are because what they have said, Mumia will get the cataracts removed, but they're not going to tell us when. But they will do it. Just tell people stop calling and stuff. Let us, you know, keep calling. Well, you know people don't come That's to right. us and That's say, right. you know, what's right. going to happen if you keep on doing that? They're just going to hold back. Excuse me. <laughs> is Mumia off of that? Call every goddamn thing. Do Mumia have right. the cure? Call 20 times. And, uh, that's because that's we right. keep pushing. That's Not right. only do we push, we fight. That's right. We fight. That's right. And, uh, and we bring more and more people on to it. So I'm saying that fight got to continue. That's right. Although Mumia can see because he took the steroids, steroids. Yeah, out. That's right. Which they were giving him. Right. Yeah. Which they was giving him. It ain't too many more of these battles. He still, at Mumia needs to be home. The evidence of innocence is there. there. Right. there. We need a movement to stand up. That's right. That's right. And all uh, you know, and if a group get locked up this morning, another group come back That's in right. this That's afternoon. Right. That's right. And, uh, and another group comes right. tomorrow. Right. And another group comes the next day. Right. So we need to organize that. Right. Right on. Right on. We need to organize right that. I'm not talking about the 24th, I'm putting that thought in people's heads. How take we it organize it and we take a, you know, you think of the before. time. We That's ain't right. talking about a day. That's right. We talking about day after day after day. We have to get told to these ministers mm -hmm. that's claiming to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We got to confront them like they have never been confronted before. Sunday morning, we must step into their churches, fly or give them information, let people know what's going on here. Do you want to be a part of a conspiracy to commit murder? Silence is not acceptable here. That's right. You know, silence is not acceptable here. We have got to go at them like we have never gone before. They're supposed to be giving him a cataract apparition. I do uh, do know in dealing with Russell Maroon Schultz that they did one eye and then they did the other. Right. And, uh, and it was time in between there. Mm -hmm. When we got the, the glaucoma is there. They have to do the cataracts first and then the, uh, work on the glaucoma. So um, we got work to do. And when I came in, a lot of people was asking me, how's Ramona? Ramona's doing good. She's doing good. Ramona is another one that they tried several times to kill. May 13th when they dropped the bomb on her. They tried to kill her inside the prison in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to kill her and the rest of the women when they was up in um, um, Painsbury Spring and in Muncie. Ramona came home firm, still putting out information. Mona had a stroke last year. And this entire part of her body was affected. Mona couldn't talk or she could do a smile. She couldn't move none of this. We had to sit Mona up. And if she sat up, you had to be behind her. And you had to like turn her so that she could sit on the side of the bed. You had to move Mona legs. Mona now can walk. And uh, you know, with the uh, walker, we found out too, you know, some things is a blessing because when Mona had the stroke, we was able to, we, the, the doctor said, if we had been five minutes later, no. Mona would have been in a full stroke thing where she would have been a vegetable for the rest of her life or she would have died. We had family members, you know, Barbara, Black Panther, her son had a stroke. With the bed had a stroke, he was gone. And uh, this is how, you, and we need to study up on these strokes. Right. It also come from weather like this. We need mm -hmm. to study on these strokes mm -hmm. and know the mm -hmm. symptoms. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people had the strokes sitting in a room where a lot of people sat and they didn't know what they was looking at. Right, right. many We have them right now. Right, 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 right. right. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. So, you know, we got to educate ourselves on that. But when she had the stroke, 
we found that Mona had cancer. That's how we found it. We would not have known right. Mona had cancer if she hadn't had the stroke. So when we found out Mona had the cancer, um, you know, they gave Mona two radiation treatments and something had happened while they couldn't give her the second, the third one. And uh, something happened because they couldn't give her the fourth, the white blood cells or something like that. I can't remember what. But by the time they got Mona back to give her the next one, Mona didn't have cancer anymore. Wow. She didn't have cancer mm -hmm. anymore. Yes, that, again, the power yeah, of the people, that, yeah. the prayers and the things of the people is what saved Mona. Yeah. And Mona is getting stronger just like she walked out that house when they dropped that bomb May 13th, on her. Right. May 13th, right. she walked out that that's hospital. Right. And I'm saying she, she is going to have two operations because when she had the stroke and uh, something happened to pull the muscles mm -hmm. up in her leg so her foot doesn't touch the floor. In fact, it dangles. She can get it down like when she's walking like this. So she had to have her Achilles heel cut and they pulled that muscle down. And right after that, everybody know when she was in that house on May 13th, the bomb mm -hmm. that they dropped that shook blocks and blocks. And uh, Mona was in that house on that ground. Can you imagine what it did to their bodies? Mona got a hip problem right now. They're going to have to deal with that. But Mona is sound. She's been doing interviews. She's been at the press conference. So how is Mona doing, y'all? Mona is on the move. Right. How is Mumia doing? Mumia's doing well. Move had two more, three more of our members released. We got two more to go. That's right. Delbert Africa, That's who right. they gave a five-year hit. Delbert and Chucky. That's right. Five-year hit they gave Delbert. You know, so while people were being released, we fighting to make sure that Delbert be amongst that. That's right. Ain't no power like the power, like the people. power of the people. Power Delbert people stop. stuff was moved up to September. Not September's five years from now. But this September, Delbert goes before the parole board and he'll be walking out of there. Chuck Africa, and uh, you know, will be walking out there as well. So this is a story of love. This is a story of the power of the people. That's right. This is a story that should uplift people. Right. While we fighting, we got to understand, we are winning. That's they right. meant to kill Mumia right. on December the 9th. They meant to kill Mumia, you know, in that electric chair. Yeah. They meant to kill, 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 and they keep failing, and we keep getting more and more help. And, uh, and again, these judges do not do the right thing Never. without the power of the That's people right. when That's it right. comes to dealing with political prisoners. Not a one of them have gotten out of jail without the power of the people. And I'm saying, Jamil, I all mean it's possible. That's right. The brother, yeah. who did you just, Sundiana. Uh, Sundiana, all of them can come home. We just got to stay consistent. Jamil. That's right. Jamil got to come home. This brother here, did somebody say he had a stroke? Yeah, just found out. I didn't know that. None yeah. of them, none of them be some people I suppose to know that. Right, right. And right. I Me stay too. on top of, yeah, mm -hmm. we, you know, it's, it's a problem here. Mm -hmm. Jamil, I mean people, you know damn well we were supposed to know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wasn't supposed to find out. But you know what? We did find out. And uh, so we got some work to do. Because the same evidence that Mia had, this brother had, mm -hmm. he don't have no business being there right. fighting for us. Fighting for us. Still in there fighting for us. We went to his court case where he was battling to get the right to speak. For 20 years, you haven't heard from him because when they sentenced him um, and he went in, I think it was after they sentenced him, they took the right away from him to speak because from prison he was organized and they wanted him to be the imam mm -hmm. of all the prisons. It's a powerful position that inmates did. And uh, they needed to silence him for 20 years. How in the hell 
Did we allow that for 20 years? You know? <coughs> but we did manage to get him out of Florence, Colorado. That's right. And That's know, right. they was trying to kill him there. That's right. But God, I did not know that this brother had so a stroke. Yeah. We have got to get that information out. What did you say, Rosa? I saw your hands. You said he had a stroke. What? See, you didn't know either. So we got, yeah, we got it. I'm, try, I'm trying to, I'm trying to pin down because I, I, this is some sideways stuff that I saw online, but it didn't come directly from any of our sources. I was just. Uh, Somebody call, Imam call Talib from that source. Just to see if we can confirm that. So we can know. Yeah, because we got to know. Because we got to leave here strong and committed to bring this brother home too. That's right. To make sure that he get the... Right now, in order for his wife to visit him, who is also his lawyer, she had got to write something out to let them know that I'm coming in Monday. And or you know, and she's coming from Atlanta to um, Arizona. Arizona That's to right. visit. She got to let them know exactly what day and who's coming with her. If somebody decides that you know, um, his son decides that he want to go with him, and or you know, and go up there with his mom, he can't get in. This is how horrible this thing is with him. And he's sick like he is. So I'm saying we got work to do, and we know that we can do it. This brother right here, Iman Lukman Abdullah, he's dead. He was murdered. He was assassinated by this government who was set, who was set, he was set up by another Iman. Mm. Raz, he was set up by another Iman. Yeah. Right. From Saudi Arabia. From Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, cause this brother Muslims, was I feeding I heard, the community. Muslims, I hope you heard that. Mm -hmm. Muslims in the house, I hope you heard that. He was feeding the community. He was constantly visiting Jamil Al-Amin when he could, before they stopped those visits. He was killed, and in their words, he was wiped out. Rod say his words, cause I messed that mess up. Here Tell them what they said. Why they, um, Killed his brother. You know, they killed him because he was uh, 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 aggressively visiting. You know what I mean? I think you aggressively this, visiting this somebody. Right. Right. The problem was this Can't brother had 35 cities connected to his organization. His group. Okay. All right. I'll tell you. Uh, you know what I mean? Is a All master right. organizer, and that's what he teaches these emails. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? And this is why I almost disassociate myself with the Philadelphia community. Because when I went to them and asked them about them, they didn't know him. How can you be a Muslim and not know him? Right, right, right. And he done all these good things. In a sick, you know, a lot of people don't know this brother. And uh, when we say H. Rap Brown, some people remember it, or some people seen the um, civil rights, you know, documentation, and that's what they call him then, H. Rap Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, formerly known as H. Rap Brown, but this is Brother Jamil Alamina, who went down in Atlanta and made, was making things right for us, getting rid of drugs, pulling our sisters off the streets from being mm. prostitutes and giving them another way, and uh, making it comfortable and uh, for elders to live in their community because they demanded that they be respected, the women and the children be respected. That's why they took him out because he was making changes. This brother here, the exact same thing. So I'm saying, this brother's going, but we can never forget. These banners here, I think I paid 200, almost $300 for this one at the time. Go online to um, popupbanners.com and get yourself a banner for your political prisoners. Design it, you can put all the black political prisoners on there. You can put all the political prisoners on there. You can make it any kind of way you want. We want to bring attention to what they was doing, what they're doing. Any place we go, when we went to Herman Ferguson funeral, we brought them. I moved nine banner, we broke that, you <laughs> know, putting it up. But you know, because people, wherever you go at, they'll say whether they know him or not, they'll say, um, did, um, who's that? 
So you tell the story. That's right. You know. That's right. right. And you have some information right. that you give them. But when, what's good about this technology, you tell them, um, Google, go to YouTube. You can find out the information. I don't use a whole lot of words, you know, when I'm on the corner, I pop these two up and I got my little stand there and I'll be doing petitions or something. You ain't got to say a whole lot of words. You ain't got to holler and scream people coming over to you. They're, oh, oh, what's this? So you teach there. You have your petitions there. And uh, you can start a whole thing. I know I do it often. And uh, bring the bullhorn, set these two up and just say one motherfucker, and some people you don't have to say that to, but you know, it's power in that word. Mona tell you that when she first came around, I had to go to the bathroom. And I said, yo, you take the mic, because she was there all the time, right? Take the mic, and I left her. And she was like, just right. talking Being about bold. it. Right, right, and right. she said, she got to thinking, she says, and these motherfuckers, and people stopped, and they started coming over. <laughs> you know, it's power in words. Yeah, but if you must and, uh, just cuss like, for freedom. That's right. Do it for freedom. Most people, when they go to a movie, if they don't hear some kind of curse word, they feel like they've been cheated. <laughs> yeah. They feel like they've been cheated. The young, What's if you don't hear the curse, oh, that's job. That's right. You do what it is to bring people in. Mm -hmm. If these motherfuckers bring people in, then let it bring in. Because people say they can't hear what you're saying for that. Yes, yes they do. Yes, they can. Yes, they are evidence. Evidence. And you know who'd be the most people be pushing and say, you got to respect the elders. It's the elders. Yeah, yeah. Herman Ferguson was one. Damn he bad. said, Pam, he said, I'm really disgusted with you. I'm like, you haven't what? said one motherfucker all That's what he'll say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what's wrong with you. Be yourself. And you really try not to. I really do. Sometimes try not to. And uh, what I'm saying, a devil is what a devil exactly. does. Exactly. A motherfucker is what, what a motherfucker, motherfucker does. does. Right. You know, these judges that's doing these things, the raping, the robbing, the bombing, the killing of our people, if you got a better word than equal motherfucker, please tell me what it is. That's right. There's no better word. There's no better word. 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 To bring attention. So, anybody got questions? Oh, right. Hey. We got these books. So 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 there. All right. I mean that you, you know, know I'm getting that second hand. He's recovered, but that's what they say. Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? As far as uh, now, this is what they say. Well, I'll talk to you about. Right on, right on, right on. But that's that's just what we're dealing with. What our other freedom fighters. As soon as something, we got volume one and volume two of um, Mumia's new books. And uh, they're twenty dollars. And uh, I yes, think we. Volume one and two is gone. Oh, two is gone. you got two volume one. I'll bring some two. I got volume, some two. I got volume one. I'll get you some two. You got what you teach How many twos we got? Two. One, you got, you got three. I mean ones. We got three books left. And uh, please tell me. I don't want to carry all this stuff back home. Your, are they going to have any books in here? In your they ain't got them yet. So get them now. But no, but Sonny, I mean, Sonny's going yeah. like this. Right, all right, all right. <laughs> Three books left. I already have book one. All right. So, Three so books. let's let's do this. Let's do this. And I and I got to do this because have Black Lives Ever Matter. He's got that in the back too. Okay. Ten. Right. Let's write on son. Right. I appreciate that. Right. Everybody, repeat after me. I'm having I'm having a senior moment. Okay. 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 <laughs> Can you use cold words? I use that. And then I call on people. Who? What? What's that? You got a nine o'clock alarm? Yes. <laughs> I got all the I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You got this in yeah. your minute over? Yeah, 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 yeah. Young heads, you ain't going to get them for a long time, but once you get them, they don't stop. 
Right? <laughs> it is our duty. It is our duty. To fight for our freedom. To fight for our freedom. It is our duty. It is our duty. To win. To win. We must love each other. We must love each other. And support each other. Support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I believe. I believe. We will win. We will win. Do y'all believe that? Yes. yes. Do y'all believe that? Yes. yes. That ain't me. That's the solid. Do y'all believe that? Yes. yes. Do y'all believe that? Yes. All right. We'll stand up and get ready to do some goddamn work. All power to the people. All power to the people. Free Abu Jamal. Free Mumia Abu Jamal. Free Sundiata. Free Sundiata. Free Iman Jamil. Free Iman Jamil. Free Jamil. Free them all. 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 We ain't gonna sing no goddamn happy birthday. We're going to go back there, cut up that cake, and we're going to buy some goddamn books. Y'all all right with that? Whoa. All power to the people. So that's my update. <laughs>